I'm calling this hearing of the Boston City Council's Ways and Means Committee to order. Um, for the record, my name is Kenzie Bach. I'm the District 8 City Councilor and also the Chair of the Council's Ways and Means Committee. This hearing is being recorded. It's being live streamed at boston.gov slash city-council-tv and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Fios Channel 964. Uh, as part of the council's budget review process, which has encompassed about 35 working sessions and hearings focused on all aspects of the city's proposed FY22 budget, um, this is the third to last of those initial round. Um, so we've got uh, this, we we'll are be talking to the Department of Innovation and Technology today, um, this evening at 6 p.m. If you'd like to come and testify on any aspect of the budget, we'd encourage you to come uh, and share your thoughts with us. Uh, and then tomorrow at 10 a.m., we have the Boston Planning and Development Authority uh, Agency. Um, and then uh, and then we'll be continuing budget review in June, um, but the departmental hearing period will be finished. Um, so if you do want to testify, you can uh, go to boston.gov slash budget dash testify to sign up. You can come join us in the Zoom today to speak on do it. You could sign up for this evening to speak on any topic. Um, you can also there submit a video um, for us to play uh, with your budget testimony. Um, you can send us an email with your written testimony at ccc.wm at boston.gov. Um, and you can always informally tweet us your questions and comments with hashtag boss budget, BOS budget. So we hope that we will hear from you. Um, and you can find that remaining schedule of hearings and any future hearings at www.boston.gov slash council dash budget. Today's hearing is on docket 0588-0590, orders for the FY21 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits. Docket 0591-0592, orders for capital fund transfer appropriation. Docket 0593-0596, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Um, and so that whole set of dockets really encompasses the full proposed FY22 um, budget that uh, came from the mayor's office in mid-April that we're considering. Um, and then today we will also be considering docket 0545, which is an order approving an appropriation from the income of the PEG access fund. Um, and our focus areas today will be, as I said before, the Department of Innovation and Technology, um, colloquially known as DOIT, um, and the PEG access fund. Um, we're very pleased today to be joined by uh, Chief David Elgis, uh, the Chief Information Officer for the City of Boston, um, and a, a substantial, um, oh, by Greg McCarthy, our Chief uh, Information Security Officer. I guess now I'm reading, well, I'm actually going to allow the Chief uh, to introduce his whole team because we have an impressive complement of folks from uh, Do It With Us today. Um, and, uh, and I know we've also got representatives from BNN Media and from Techco's Home here to talk about the benefits of the PEG Access Fund. Um, but before we go to the administration team, I just wanna thank my colleagues for joining. I'm joined here by Councillor Andrea Campbell, District 4, Councillor Matt O'Malley, District 6, and also our President Pro Tem, uh, Councillor Liz Braden, District 9, and Councillor Michelle Wu at large. Um, so thank you to all of them and to other councillors who may join um, as we continue. Uh, so I think, um, David, that I will pass it over to you now to kick us off. Um, and then, uh, yeah, once we hear from the team, obviously, then we'll move to Councillor Question. Thank you. Perfect. Good morning, Madam Chair, and good morning, President O'Malley, and good morning to all the members of the City Council joining us on this morning's call. I'm here today as the Chief Information Officer for the City of Boston to testify on Mayor Janey's proposed FY22 budget for the Department of Innovation and Technology, also known as Do It. I'd like to introduce members of my team that are joining me here this morning. There is Greg McCarthy, the Chief Information Security Officer, Jenneth Falvey, the Chief Digital Officer, Sarah Fegalora, the Chief of Staff, Mike Lynch, the Director of Broadband and Cable, Eddie Pinkerton, the Director of Operations, and Michael Hamill, the Chief of Enterprise Applications. Sarah, Mike, Greg, Jeanette, Michael, and Eddie, as well as many other members of the Do It leadership team, oversee the work that we do every day and have put a great deal of effort into planning the projects that are included in this year's budget recommendation. I'd first like, to, first like to share some information about the mission of Do It, my department, and some of our recent accomplishments, as well as some of the upcoming priorities reflected in our FY22 proposal budget. The Department of Innovation and Technology, also known as Do It, is a trusted steward of innovation and technology, a catalyst for innovation. The past 15 plus months have been a very defining moment for Do It, answering that longstanding question how does technology respond during a crisis? And I can say with total conviction 
that my team stepped up to the challenge and continues to do so today as the city, city starts opening up post COVID. We focus on enabling city operations by consistently delivering reliable and secure services and innovation solutions as we strive for best in class customer service with experience and we have with our end users. Our continued goal is to help the city deliver excellent service to our residents and businesses by equipping our departments with technology and support that they need. Additionally, we strive to create a learning culture for our employees that encourages smart risk-taking, creativity, integrity, curiosity, rapid evaluation, deployment, and encourage adaptability in the face of an ever-changing technology landscape. At no other time has our mission been tested more so than, than the current COVID-19 pandemic that all of our fellow Bostonians are facing today as we eagerly look to getting back to the new normal in whatever shape that may take on. Do it has six core function areas. Uh, core infrastructure, the infrastructure team manages the city's networks, servers, data centers, phones, desktop computers, and are at the core backbone of the city's technology efforts as we aim to deliver infrastructure that is secure, modern, and resilient. Enterprise applications. The applications team supports the core application systems that the city uses to run its business, from but not limited to our ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning System and Tax Systems, manages the city's finances, as well as our back office systems that sit behind and support many of our customer transactions. The goal of the applications team is to equip the city and employees with great technology to assist them in delivering uh, a, a excellent service to our residents every day. The digital engagement and service delivery. The digital team runs our city websites, social media programs, and many of our mobile applications, including our CRM, customer relationship management system that support our 311 service. The digital team aims to make information services available via digital services and deliver friendly, convenient, and accessible experience. Data and analytics. The data team helps the city use one of its most valuable assets, its data, to improve the quality of life of everyday Bostonians, to improve the overall effectiveness of government operations. They build dashboards, create analytical tools, and provide operational support to departments using data to improve outcomes for our residents. Broadband cable and digital equity. The broadband team works towards the goal of a city where every resident and business has the access uh, and affordable bandwidth internet and the skills they need to succeed in the digital age. The broadband team centers around encouraging competition in the broadband marketplace and supporting programs that assist our unconnected residents. And lastly, security. There is a tremendous amount of public safety and operational, reputational, and political risk associated with IT security and privacy breaches. While there's no solution that can be guaranteed 100%, security has been, uh, we've have adopted an industry best practice and a multi-layered approach to managing cybersecurity risk with it includes people, process, and technology, as well as industry leading technology and working with great solutions partners. We will continue to improve our security posture and address a consistently evolving threat landscape as we continue to increase our investments in cybersecurity, network security, cyber resiliency, infrastructure security, and operational and business continuity in the upcoming years. We strive to ensure that the interactions that the residents have with the city of Boston are safe and secure we accomplish it by utilizing a full spectrum layered approach to cybersecurity from perimeter, network, data, application, and device security. However, this is not enough. We also have a process of which hardening our overall security framework with a focus on improving the city's overall security culture as a vital component to the overall risk management. Given our broad portfolio of responsibilities, I won't go into detail on all the projects that we have done, but over the past year, but I will highlight a few of the accomplishments that we've accomplished over the, the last fiscal year. Supporting digital equity in the city of Boston. COVID-19 changed digital access from nice to have to a must have. 
Since the pandemic began, we delivered 5,000 hotspots to families without connectivity or stable home environment and have deployed 2,500 tablets to, to vulnerable populations, including those in recovery, those experiencing homelessness, isolated seniors, and immigrant families. We are currently distributing $250,000 in mini grants to directly support the needs around technology, equipment, access, and training. Information and supporting the city's COVID-19 response. At a time when so many things were rapidly changing, we were able to support the city's leadership with data dashboards that they needed to deliver critical and crucial real-time insights to make data-informed decisions. As processes were continually evolving and being implemented to support the city's response to the pandemic, our team was able to rapidly deploy forms, workflows needed to make those processes successful. Keeping residents safe and informed. Our outward-facing content efforts over the last year ensured residents had the latest COVID-19 updates in near real time. The team supported a distribution of content across a multitude of engagement platforms, including Boston.gov, social media channels, news, newsletters, and digital screens across the city and in local communities. We ensure COVID-19 messages were released in multiple languages to make sure that we are reaching as many Bostonians as possible. Technology platforms and infrastructure enhancements. In the past year, we have made significant infrastructure and platform enhancements to deliver continued services to the city's departments and improve the security and resiliency of our tools. This work has been made easier for remote employees to access the tools they need to do their work and has supported the return of staff and students to Boston Public Schools. Our enhancements to enterprise applications have improved our ability to support the licensing and permitting needs of the community as well. Securing our environment. As we respond to changes in the workforce, keeping our environment secure was always at the forefront of every decision. Over the last year, we have worked diligently to increase our security posture in the city by updating the way employees access critical core programs, increasing protection measures around data transfers, implementing, a data, loss implementing data loss prevention measures, and adding increased protection measures to the city's email and sharing applications. Supporting our fellow departments and employees. Every team member has stepped up in the last year to support our colleagues through remote work troubleshooting and return to work troubleshooting. And with, with finding the best technical solutions to deliver the best in class services to our constituents. Essential, mem essential members of our team were on site at city, at city locations throughout the pandemic, supporting on site technology and ensuring that employees could effectively work from home. As we look towards FY22 with a focus on recovery, reopening, and renewal, we are excited by what we can accomplish with this budget with the support of the City Council. And a few highlights include digital equity initiatives and broadband expansion. A major investment dedicated to digital equity initiatives and expansion of wicked free Wi Fi, ongoing support for 7,500 tablets and hotspots distributed to st students, seniors, and immigrant populations in response to COVID 19, as well as hiring a digital equity advocate to support our strategic plan and providing a direct line of co connection to the community. Improving access to digital services. Moving the Boston Public Health Commission, BDHC's website to boston.gov to, to support and enhance the user experience and have a single voice of truth for vital critical city information, enhancing our, I'm sorry, enhancements to the Boston 311 program including updates to current back-end and front-end applications to support a better user experience and better supporting accessibility, as well as redundancy and reliability. Implementing enhancements to enterprise applications. Major enhancements to our human capital management and financials applications to secure a streamline processes and implement a new legislative management system to support operational needs 
and improve transparency. Upgrades to our geographic information systems infrastructure to support the maintenance and deployment of geospatial tools, investments in e-signature and grant management platforms. Enhancements to the cybersecurity, enhance, enhancing the cybersecurity of our environment. Advanced tools to manage and monitor systems and applications and ensuring data remains secure. An expansion of our incident response infrastructure and the implementation of tools to protect our systems from malicious activity. Infrastructure investments to remain connected and secure. Continued expansion of Boston's fiber network, BoNet, to increase connectivity between municipal buildings. Continue to build out of our telephony VOIP, voice over IP for departments and city locations. Leveraging the power of data and analytics and data science. Developing a new data sources, pipelines, web services to support departments, projects related to dashboards, reports, maps, analysis, forms, and workflows. Maintenance and new development related data and documentation on Analyze Boston. Alongside with continued focus on the latest data security standards. These and many other projects are outlined in the proposed FY22 budget materials. The Department of Innovation Technology is here to help government, businesses, and our residents succeed. Our mission is to support the delivery of exceptional city services. Throughout the use of technology, we are not here to simply provide IT services, but to be a true partner with other city departments, creating great outcomes for the resident of Boston. I want to close by saying thank you to a few key people, starting off with Mayor Janey for her vision and strong leadership, along with her unwavering support as we enhance online service delivery as we come out of COVID-19 and transform the way the city of Boston delivers services to our residents as we continue to come out of our COVID-19 pandemic. I'd also like to say thank Justin Sterrett, our CFO, and the entire budget team for working tirelessly in a very difficult time to make a very solid budget. I'm confident that given the technology investments that we have made in recent years and that we are proposing for FY22, that we are on a very solid footing as we focus on the important groundwork to support citywide strategic initiatives. I also wanna thank the dedicated employees that make up Do It, who do this hard work day in and day out. I'm truly very proud of what we have accomplished together over the past year, especially over the past year to support the city of Boston and our continued operations in the wake of the COVID-19 outbreak. Our efforts are not always visible and they are certainly not always glamorous. But as we learned over the past year across the country from governors and mayor alike, that IT operational continuity and the city's online presence at digital outreach are the backbone to serving our residents in a crisis and are paramount in paving the road to reopening the city of Boston. Our work often takes tremendous amount of collaboration, patience, thoughtfulness, and dedication. However, the importance of this work cannot be understated in its critical operational continuity for the city of Boston. Much of what Do It employees do every day is the core backbone of online communications, public data, software applications, connectivity, digital equity in the city of Boston. And lastly, a sincere thank you to the city council for continued support, our, continue to supporting our mission and the services that we deliver and the critical work that we do every single day. Thank you and I, along with my team, are happy to take any questions that you may have. Great, thank you so much, Chief. Um, very much appreciate those thorough remarks. Yes. Um, I also want to note that we've been joined by my colleagues, Councillor Julia Mejia and Councillor Ed Flynn as well. Um, I think we'll probably just jump straight into questions. Um, so uh, the order will be, I'll, I'll defer mine to the end, um, Campbell, O'Malley, Braden, Wu, Mejia, Flynn. Um, and we'll do a first round of questions and then I'll probably take um, the comments on the PEG access fund before the second round. So that's my, um, that's my plan. Um, Councillor Campbell, you have the floor. Thank you, 
Okay, here we go. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, um, Councillor Bach. And uh, David, thank you and your entire team for your hard work. Just extending gratitude, not only for me, but for my team as well. We're constantly in contact with Do It with respect to the police department or anything else for that matter. So really grateful to you and your team uh, for the work, particularly through the pandemic. Um, you know, renewed focus on the digital divide, of course, which is a good thing, right? Coming out of uh, this pandemic, we have an opportunity to really close that. Um, so I, I would love to hear a little bit more on just that, right? As we know that residents are going to be more dependent on technology, for employment opportunities, telehealth is going to expand. Um, where are you seeing the possibilities, not only for the city, but also external to the city? How other players and stakeholders might also play a role in closing the digital divide? Would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, my second question is, um, I'm just gonna ask all my questions at once so you can answer those before we see the gavel. Um, clearly with the pandemic, there were probably some projects or things that were put aside that the team could not work on because of the pandemic. So curious what some of those projects are. What were some of those initiatives, probably department focused um, in terms of efficiency that had to be put to the side that you hope to bring back um, now that we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel with respect to the pandemic. And then um, my third question, and I think there's still time for this um, is, you know, you've been, we, we had a hearing once with do it, police department, data, analyzing data. Obviously, a, a whole bunch of departments are collecting information that they think is useful. Um, on a recent budget hearing, the youth engagement uh, department was talking about youth engagement and employment, how they have a whole bunch of data, but actually, actually are hiring a, hu a human capital or position, a research position to analyze that data so it can be useful in closing gaps and putting forth more thoughtful policy going forward. So I'm curious, where do you see uh, your department being able to provide even greater support and assistance to departments um, I know you already are, um, but where are there opportunities and what are the barriers to those greater supports So many of these departments that have a whole bunch of information, don't know necessarily what to do it and do with it. It's not like you said, just technical assistance. It's deeper than that. It really is policy development um, and solutions to the very problems facing our, our residents. So curious what that looks like from your vantage point and where the barriers are um, in terms of being able to support departments throughout the city. I think that's enough for now. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to your team as well. Thank you. That's a great start. And all very great questions and very important questions. And, you know, and as you said, that uh, the digital divide, I mean, even though the, the term the digital divide was a term that was coined in kind of the late 90s, I think uh, 1998, if I'm not mistaken. And that was really the transition between moving people off of kind of phone lines you know, hardline phone lines to more internet access because our world was changing. Um, and very much so that it became, you know, it went from a nice to have to a must have. And COVID-19 really brought this to the forefront, you know, and, and, and it was definitely, you know, dead center, you know, on, on my team as we were, both myself and, and, and Mike Lynch, as we were scrambling to get hot spots for students that we just sent home and, and, and supporting the, you know, the school with, you know, their Chromebook deployment. And, uh, but, but also, you know, as we had also kind of learned from, you know, the pandemic, which, um, you know, obviously brought its own set of challenges we also have a lot of other populations that are feeling the brunt of, of that pandemic, such as senior citizens that are feeling isolated and not being able to reach out to grandchildren or family or friends. And, and it's a bit of a perfect storm for them because they're also, they're not technology natives, they're technology immigrants. And that's even a little bit iffy there. Um, and they are, um, a, a lot of our senior citizens and a lot of elderly community really uh, lack a lot of the, the comfort level or skill um, to really kind of navigate uh, the, the technology and, and the internet. 
But, you know, we also have, you know, uh, uh, you know, the immigrant community that is also feeling isolated. And I can go on and on and on. So it was very much a, 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 a an eye opening experience. Um, you know, as I said in my you know opening statement that this is something that that I am in ongoing conversations from CIOs from Los Angeles to Atlanta to DC to Philadelphia. We're all trying to solve this problem, and we all are having different approaches on on how to how to tackle this. Um, there is a, and and I think that you touched on it, but if if you haven't, I'll I'll kind of touch on it anyway. I think that we do have a real opportunity in front of us from stimulus money, from CARES Act funding, from ARPA funding, from, you know, and the list goes on and on and on. And this is probably um, federal funding that we will not see again in my lifetime. This is this is one time, um, this is one time uh, influx of money that could really help us turn the tide in, in answering that that longstanding call from the early 90, late 90s is how, what are you gonna do about the digital divide? How are you going to connect your residents in underserved areas, elderly populations, you know, immigrant families that are, you know, and, and, and households that are unstable. Um, and this is really an opportunity that we can focus. And, and one of the things that Mike Lynch and I have been talking about, as well as Justin Sterrett and myself, is really some moonshot ideas and how we can really focus on uh, bridging that divide. And we've always approached it around competition. We've had some of our partners that have really stepped up to the plate and 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 worked in in my hat my hats off to, to Mike Lynch, who was really kind of pushing this with a lot of the providers, making sure that we we had an opportunity to connect some of those residents. But in COVID-19, there was a bit of different challenges because um, with a lot of the providers that were looking to do um, a connection in your house, you know, turn the clock back a couple of months, I wasn't allowing anyone in my house, you know, so there, therein lies the challenge. And, uh, you know, and then you're giving a hotspot to someone who may not know how to set it up and how to work it. So it was a, a very challenging time. But now as we come out of COVID-19, this is an opportunity to really kind of get back to, to uh, focusing on putting broadband in households. Um, and, and I've always kind of looked at the, the digital divide, the digital equity space, kind of a bit of a, a three-legged stool. And I know we're going to wind up talking about all three legs as we go through today's hearing. One is really kind of the digital equity space. The other one is kind of wicked free wireless, which, which is more of a convenience for Bostonians and is more in kind of public spaces, near city buildings, things like that. And then there is the proliferation of 5G in the city. Uh, because as you know, a lot of people, they the only smart device that they have to get on the information superhighway may just be a smartphone. And that's it. You know, so we need to find a way to, to connect our residents. I know that we are having a lot of you know ongoing conversations of of how we can leverage a lot of these stimulus federal dollars to to answer that question, and that is an ongoing conversation. And you know, both Mike and Lynch, Mike Lynch and myself are very passionate about closing this divide. I was just in a conference earlier this week talking about it as well. So it is it is very much a passion of mine to really um, focus on on closing this divide as much as we can. Um, because it's 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 one of those, it was one of those stark realities as, you know, in the early days of COVID-19 and we sent a lot of school aged children home, not knowing if they even have connection at home, you know, and it was a, it was a challenging time. Um, so it's, it's, it's an ongoing, it's, it's an ongoing conversation as we are putting uh, these ideas, uh, you know, pen to paper, you know, in, 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 in crafting for some of these federal dollars to, to address this in the city of Boston. Um, as for projects in the city of Boston that we have postponed because of um, the pandemic, um, I know there were some, there were some initiatives that, that we were focused on that we didn't uh, kind of get around to either completing or fully completing. Um, I know we had 
we're focused on moving off of more of a reliance of third-party providers. Um, and, and that didn't kind of fully happen as we were looking to um, make some kind of, you know, reductions. Um, but being that everyone went remote one day, all of a sudden we needed to bolster up our service desk to support all now these remote workers that are not in city buildings anymore. Now they're all over the city of Boston. Um, so that, that was a, a bit of a challenging time. Um, there was a, you know, an operational audit that we had talked about this time last year that we were trying to do, um, that the COVID-19 really kind of um, slowed that down a little bit. That is something that we are going to visit. But, you know, I, I must say, and I'll, I'll kind of defer to, to Eddie to keep me honest here. Um, I, through this pandemic, we did not reduce any of our services. We were not only focused internally on do it, but we were kind of, we were being, you know, we, we were being a bit bilingual there. We were not only helping ourselves, we were helping every other department at the same time. So, you know, we were focused on um, not only the services that we deliver and evolving those and changing those for uh, the pandemic and how our workforce changed, but we were also working with other city departments, standing up call centers for Age Strong and 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 uh, our Treasury Department and finding out ways for for people to create appointments online, um, so that when they came into City Hall to conduct their business, they did it in a safe way. So I I don't think that we had. I don't think that we had delayed any major projects because of COVID-19. Um, but but and before I get kind of to your third question, I'll ask Eddie. I might and Mike, have to uh, keep my he, third question. I see the gavel doing Yeah, we, we may have to save oh, Councillor Campbell's third yeah. question for the second round. That's that's right. And and I can res I want to respect my uh, other council colleagues in terms okay. of uh, time. So I can save the third question for the next round, David. Thanks so much. And, and I think I think David would probably make sense is for me to go to the next counselor just because we've uh, gone a while. Over oh, this is all time. great. Thank you, David. You got the first question, so I ran a little long. <laughs> it's totally fine. It's, it, as you should. You guys have done a lot this year, so thank you so much. All right, David, there's nothing more discussed and less respected than my gavel in this process. So, um, <laughs> but we, we, you know, and we do try to kind of let everybody get to their turns. So, um, Councillor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Chair Buck. Uh, I think uh, our old friend Pat Brophy would be proud, uh, who's well known for his uh, great answers. But, Chief, well said you can hear the passion in your voice um it, it goes without saying the remarkable work that everyone in do it has done over the last year or last 14 15 months at this point and i am so grateful for your leadership and all of your colleagues um just seeing the people on this call you know mike lynch who i know has been a tireless worker i miss uh, i usually would see mike lynch at uh at harry's uh, all american breakfast joint in our neighborhood, and I haven't seen it Sunday. Uh, similarly, Glenn Williams, I'd always see running around uh, Rosie Square. So thank you for your your leadership. And, and one quick shout out to Diana Orthman, who's just been such a great resource to me and my team. And on behalf of everyone, thank you. It's really remarkable how, um, when we think about sort of post-pandemic life um, and how challenging this year has been. Um, how so many of us were able to adapt. And I think that it is um, an embrace of technology unlike we've ever seen. And I think back to my mother, um, who somewhat technologically uh, advanced, I would say, but, but took a class with some of her friends online to learn how to use Zoom so that she could FaceTime and, and connect with her Zoom with, uh, with her grandkids. And you saw that. You saw how we were all able to adapt. Um, you know, a year and a half ago, Zoom, you know, Mike Lynch and I thought Zoom was the old PBS show. We didn't even know it was a technology that would be such a part of our life. I love uh, that show. And I think as it relates to municipal government, and, and I, I said this as the as the acting president or the president pro tem, um, we're going to use this, you know, God willing, with some changes to state legislation to allow for better citizen interaction. Similarly, the ZBA has been able to do that. And I would say that you all help facilitate better services. I mean, we we... we I won't say we're troglodytes in this city, but as uh, in, in 
we all remember when it was hard to get things done online, which normally would be easy to do and, and allow for a uh, great view. So let's keep that up. I'm delighted to see this increase in your budget to the tune of over 13%. I think it should be 50%, quite frankly, because um, there's so much more I want to see happen, and, and I will continue to advocate for that. Um, but I'm just really, really grateful for each and every one of you. I've gone, and, and I think filibustered half my time, so I'll get into it with the questions. Um, it's really for this round, talking about reopening. Um, I am coming to you from my office. I am on my laptop. This is a pretty good connection, but as the chair knows, it's it's hit or miss. Just where I am, um, there is construction outside. But Chief, can you talk about some internal upgrades to our network and uh, increased bandwidth for the fact that we will be um, using more, more and more bandwidth? Um, can you talk sort of briefly about that for uh, the year ahead? Absolutely, and, and that is something that um, we knew was going to be an issue. We've, you know, not only that, but we've, um, we saw it also with the, with the schools um, as, their, as their model was changing as well and they were coming back to classrooms and, and they were having Zoom sessions. Every student was in a Zoom session, looking at a gal review as we are looking at today and understanding the, the bandwidth of, of what that takes uh, you know, uh, from from the school that has a a fixed amount of bandwidth for each for each uh, physical location, and we saw that from K through eight, and then when you know when high schoolers started to come back, we saw that as well. Um, you know, as much as we were focused on doing the expansion and creating and being create creative with the bandwidth with that they had there, we're looking to also do it here as well. So it's a lot of conversations I've had with our chief technology officer, not only kind of really twofold, one um, as the guidance that we have given our workers. So we have handed out a lot of laptops and, but when people come back to city hall, they still have their desktops sitting there waiting for them that have been there basically hibernating for the last 15 months. Um, so the focus was really to get a sense of when they come back to use their desktop computers first so that we can get a sense of in terms of the wireless connectivity what does you know the city buildings not only city hall but you know 1010 and mass avenue and court street and, and on and on and on um what is our coverage map going to look like? And that's one of the things that I've been talking around about with our, our chief technology officer yeah. is a, a coverage map, you know, just focused on city hall since most of us are sitting in city hall. Um, I'm sorry to cut you off chief, but just, just so for our desktops though, most would need to be, we need to get a webcam. We need to get speakers. Correct. Correct. Um, is that budget? Is that like, do you have money already allocated for that? So we did not we did not budget we did not budget cameras, but we did budget headphones. Okay. Because to have a you know, this is a benefit to, to visually see you, but on a Zoom session, as we see from other people, you can still listen and talk and, and be part of the working in Zoom without visually seeing somebody. So the head headsets were actually budgeted. So I I Pre, you're right. Um, it's 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 a uh, no no offense to our friends and my colleagues who don't have their cameras on. It is a pet peeve of mine, and, and I do think being in the customer service business, as we all are in local government, we should have that option. So I think this underscores both a point and a statement. And I know this isn't your call, but, but um, you know, I I would urge uh, you know the acting mayor as she comes up with other guidelines to return to work that we do allow flexibility and allow individuals to have some staggered approach so that they can continue to use their desktop, their laptops, issued last laptops to work. You know, and the guy, I've read the entire reopening guidelines. I came up with my own guidelines for the council, which allow more flexibility. But I think we've both discouraged individuals from meeting in person, which I totally get. Um, but we're going to put, I think, more of a, of a really heavy drain and strain on our network. And then if we even have if we encourage folks to use desktops as opposed to laptops, which makes sense just in terms of they're hardwired and you're going to get a better connection, but then not allow to at least have the cameras on, or at least we don't have budgeted money for cameras, that's a concern um, to me because I think that as we talk about sort of seeing individuals, um, you know, seeing constituents is is an important part of that that interface. You'd argue that phone calls we aren't able to see, and that's that's a valid point. But I just think the fact that this technology has been embraced, I want us to continue to use it for both the, the safety and peace of mind our employees and the ease of use for our constituents. 
So sure. I guess that would just sort of be my request going back. Of the laptops that have been handed out to um, workers, how many, I know we, you guys working with BPS did 30,000 or so Chromebooks, a staggering number. How many laptops were given to city employees um, for usage last year? Um, Sarah, keep me honest here. Was it around 500? Five it, it was around 400. 400. That's great. That's great. And those individuals will be able to keep those laptops to continue to work from them, or will they have to give them back to the to you so guys? Some of it ties into our, our, our upgrade. So one of the things that we were talking about in the last uh, council hearing is that we were, we were doing our upgrade from Windows 7, which is no longer supported, to Windows 10. So And then the pandemic hit. So some of our equipment is upgraded. Some is not. The goal is that they were going to be focused on keeping their laptops, but we're going to a one device policy. So it's it's either going to be the desktop or the laptop. We just want to make sure from a laptop perspective that we don't have the experience that 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 you had mentioned, you know, you know, at the, at the top of of your your, your yeah. questions that they have spotty coverage. So we want to make sure that, that. But I guess, I guess to still allow the flexibility of an individual to to work from home on certain days or certain hours of the day with with a laptop seems to make sense it would also remove people from using up sort of the bandwidth here so it's i know it's complicated and i don't want us to go too far afield from the purpose of this which is a budget hearing other than to say um you guys have done remarkable work getting us through the last year as we talk about reopening i would again use this opportunity to to urge us to take a more methodical approach to reopening and obviously part of that is Safety is health, is guidelines, but also making sure that we have the technological capability that we can't just a month from now have the building at full capacity and sort of, I mean, the system could absolutely be put in peril. So, um, you know, anything we can do in the weeks ahead as we finish our budget process to make sure you have the resources, Chief, and your team um, count me in because I think that this, I always enjoy this budget hearing because it's really interesting to see how we've embraced technology, how we've developed other apps, how we've worked on things. But I think that now more than ever, people understand that, that um, you know, the internet is a utility, is a national utility. We should teach it as uh, treat it as such and make sure that folks have access to it and that it's safe and affordable um, and always working. So I appreciate all your leadership there. And that will be it for this round. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, President O'Malley. Great, thank you so much, Matt. Um, next up is uh, Councillor Braden, and then it'll be Councillor Mejia. Councillor Braden. Thank you. I'm on screen. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your amazing team and all the great work you've done this past uh, 16 months or so. Um, I don't know where we'd have been without without the support of, uh, of Do It and uh, all of the city departments who, you know, we switched... Uh, we switched um, modes of operation very quickly and uh, trans transitioned to a completely different way of doing things. And now we're in the, on the moment of transitioning back. And it seems like some of the things that we did in, in during the pandemic, we, we want to continue doing like hybrid meetings, hybrid. Uh, I would just uh, get you, like to get your insights on, on the, on the challenges of doing um, hybrid community meetings, in-person meetings with, a, a hybrid link, um, even it's outside, it may be out in a library or a community center or somewhere, but um, that's that's something that uh, has a way of increasing our reach and being able to engage with more people. Um, I also had a question about the public libraries and, and, the, and the status of their, um, you know, their, their, their essential hubs for uh, internet and broadband access and, um, uh, is there any plans to expand that? Because in the, it, it, it just seems that um, we need to utilize all our all our all our city buildings to the utmost to enable better access. And um, let's see. And I had a question. You know, I'm I'm a little, always uh, intrigued by cybersecurity, and and I don't. I, it's a bit like the air internal combustion engine. I don't, don't necessarily understand how it works, but I know it's essential. Um, you know, in terms of of real time threats, do, do how do how do we monitor uh, threats, and and um, and what is the uh, capacity of the city uh, and do it to respond, or do you need to draw in? Uh, support from federal agencies and and other other um, cybersecurity um, 
um, agencies and and organizations to to help in the event of a, a cyber um, a cyber attack. Thank you. Those are my questions. And if Thank that's you, uh, if that's <laughs> if, if that's secret. Uh, um, um, intelligence, don't you don't have to share it. <laughs> it's it's all good, all you know, all very good questions. I I will start with the the last one first because I'm going to hand it over to Greg McCarthy, um, our our chief information security officer. And you know, a, and as I said in kind of my opening statement, it it you know I, I don't think a week goes by that we're not hearing a cyber incident, whether it's in a gas pipeline or a meatpacking plant or closer to home. And I just heard this morning about the ferry, you know, and in the ransomware attack that they had there. Um, unfortunately, and, and I think that this term has gotten gotten overused too much recently. I feel like that has become the new normal. Is uh, is you know one cyber incident after another. Um, we work on very much a. a a strategy of, you know, there, like I said, there's no 100% guarantee, but it's very much focused on um, cybersecurity, which is really kind of your forward facing and kind of your perimeter defense and more cyber resiliency so that when you're being attacked to minimize the damage and then cyber response for after an event, how you can quickly respond to recover and things like that. So there's very much a layered approach. I don't want to steal Greg's thunder. So I will I will pass it over to Greg McCarthy now to kind of unpack that that response a little bit more. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Counselor. Um, so so the first question you touched on was around uh, real-time threat monitoring. So uh, my team works tirelessly to ensure that we're um, up to date and educated on the most recent threats that are um, attacking government and, and private sector individuals. Um, we, we partner with the federal government, we partner with the state government um, to get information uh, on a regular basis. Um, we also have third party partners that provide data to us um, in order to determine um, what we call indicators of compromise. So they're, um, known bad things that we look for in our network uh, in order to uh, to prevent them from from becoming much worse. Um, the the other thing that that I can um, share with you is that the city of Boston was one of the founding members of a newly formed coalition of city CISOs. So this is a collaborative partnership across city governments throughout the country. Um, and we share best practices and information. So if San Francisco or Dallas is seeing some sort of cyber attack or um, cyber disruption. Um, we're, we're looped into that and we can share best practices and information in real time with each other. So that's a really great network that we are part of and we were one of the founding members of. Um, from a response perspective, because nothing is 100% so nothing is 100% secure, um, we have to be ready to respond if there is some sort of incident. Um, so we work on our incident response process. Um, and part of that is also regularly testing it to make sure that what we've documented uh, as far as a process actually works. So we can simulate certain scenarios and walk through those and say, okay, does step 15 actually makes sense to follow uh, in, in an actual scenario. Um, we, as I mentioned, we partner with the federal government, we partner with state agencies. Being a government entity, we're very fortunate to have um, a lot of external resources available to us um, free of charge, like the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center. They provide incident response services in the case that we would need them. Um, the federal government, the state agencies, um, they also provide assistance in the case that we would need some of that. Um, but we do regularly um, work towards uh, responding to incidents in-house if, 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 uh, when possible. Very good. Thank you. And I will go to the first question, and then I will uh, pass it over to, to Mike Lynch to see what uh, we can dive into to uh, more about the libraries and their expansion in, in you know, around kind of wireless and, and broadband expansion and, and whatnot. So your first questions are around kind of really the lessons learned. There, there is a, a task force that we are putting together, and there were a lot of really good things that came out of, of a very 
challenging and difficult and impactful time of, of COVID-19 um, that I think are, are very beneficial to keep these things going. And, and I think you touched on a lot of these community meetings that it, 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 the, the engagement was better. Um, yeah. which, is, which is a great starting point. That's exactly what we want to hear, um, you know, and as we look at, you know, kind of scheduling services and focus on that digital transformation and putting more of our services online to reduce the need to actually come to a city building. Um, these are the things that we are going to continue to look at. What a hybrid workforce working remotely would, would look like. We're in conversations about that. That's a little bit more complicated because we're in a heavily uh, unionized environment. Um, so there's a lot of conversations that would need to happen with the union. But we are we are keeping everything on the table. We are really highlighting the things that have really risen to the top during this this challenging time that have become very beneficial, and we want to keep them. Um, but you know, I, I think that there's a great opportunity to really uh, make these part of our new practice going forward. Um, that you know could bring about engagement, could bring about ease of uh, of of doing services with municipal government. Um, so I think it's a, a great opportunity, and I'm and I'm full in support of this. And I'm a member that's going to be on this task force that is going to be looking at these things. And uh, you know, with technology, you know, I mean, really, you know, uh, the, the 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 doors are, are wide open with what technology can do. We just need to kind of really understand what the goal is and where we're trying to go. Um, and I see the, I see the gavel up. Uh, yeah, so, I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will stop and I guess we'll, 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 we'll talk about BPL, you know, in the next round. Very good. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I think we keep getting to the point where Mike Lynch is supposed to weigh in. He's going to get his moment in the sun. Yeah, but... Mike's going to get his 15 minutes of fame. Yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll get back. Um, all right. Next up uh, is Councillor Mejia, and then it'll be Councillor Flynn. And I want to note that we've also been joined by Councillor Michael Flaherty at large. Um, Councillor Mejia. Hi, yes. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes, we can. Awesome. And thank you again to do it and your entire team for um, your hard work. During these most trying times, you guys have risen to the occasion and have over delivered in so many ways. So we really do appreciate you all. Um, I just have a few questions. I'm curious about how does Do It work to create new web pages for new programs started in the city that have been passed by the council? I'm thinking particularly around our residential kitchens. We've gotten a lot of requests. And so I'm just curious about what the implementation process looks like um, for adding new web pages to our um, city website. Um, the city um, says that the website is readable at an eighth grade level. I always talk about um, how some folks are, are still struggling to read and write even in their own native language. And I'm wondering how we landed on eighth grade in particular. Um, how was that decision made? There are a lot of people, particularly immigrants, um, who have not even, uh, who are not even reading at that capacity. So I'm just curious about kind of like how we landed there and what are, what are we thinking about in terms of expanding that? Um, and then uh, you mentioned a few times um, in your answers that private companies like Comcast, Verizon, and RCN have all built their broadband infrastructures um, for more far more than the city could do. And are we working with these um, providers to help expand uh, access to municipal broadband? You've mentioned that their work has created both service providers and competitors. And I'm wondering whether you see them as one or the other. Um, I will start with the, the last one first, because this is also a chance to for me to tap on Mike Lynch. Um, yes, we, we, we work with, with all the major carriers, uh, and we really see them as a, a, a partner in, 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 in focusing on our, our broadband providers. Um, it, 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 it's an opportunity to really um, ex expand the proliferation of, of connectivity, you know, the uh, connectivity around the city of Boston. So I don't, I don't, it, it, it's good that we are bringing about the competition between them, which is, is great having options for our Bostonians. It's also good for bringing down price. Um, but it's, it, I, I don't, I, 
this is this is a great opportunity as we kind of look forward in 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 partnering with a lot of companies like Comcast, which was critical in the internet essentials, you know, giving connectivity uh, for very low cost uh, during this very difficult time. Uh, from working with Verizon to to help their build out, you know, working with them on their 5G deployment. So this is uh, every, everyone is is really kind of stepping up to the plate. Um, as we start to kind of build out options through the city. Um, Michael, I'm, I'm not sure this first time I'm calling on you. Uh, anything you'd like to, to add before I turn it over to Jeanette on digital? Oh, just just briefly, uh, thank you. Um, regarding the broadband providers, you know, Comcast and Verizon are the big ones. Comcast started as a TV cable company and is now essentially a broadband provider. Verizon started as a phone company, but really is a broadband and wireless provider in Boston. We have a few other companies too. RCN is one, and there's also um, Starry, which is a new provider, does wireless rooftops. BHA is working on a pilot with them. And NetBlazer, who do a number of uh, smaller MDU buildings across the city as well, kind of a community-oriented wireless provider. All of them are providing kind of ubiquitous coverage across the city. Uh, the city's network is slightly different. The city's network is the city use because we don't actually own the fiber that we're using. We, we got it from these companies with the provisio that we wouldn't compete with them. Uh, at the same point, we have the coverage we need across the city. Our challenge, as the councilor appropriately raised, is it is expensive. And that's where we come in and we try to fill the gaps where we can. Um, I, I just, David, the reason I took this opportunity, and Councillor, if you'll allow me, one of the key elements is that just in the last week, one of the big federal programs, the Emergency Broadband Benefit, came into action. I think it was May 12th. This will give people in need $50 a month to cover their cost of broadband. But it's a little complicated and messy to get there. You got to go to your provider, you got to get your hotspot, you got to file this stuff with the FCC. It's tricky. We are working with probably 200 social service agencies across the city to get their clients, uh, residents, access to this funding so that it'll be able to bring them into the digital world without sort of that, that economic penalty of an expensive added cost. Uh, what I will do after the hearing is share some slides and some information with the counselors. Hopefully this information can get out through your avenues as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, as for our, our, our web page and in the process for, for getting them online and in the, the, how we landed on an eighth grade leaving, reading level, I'll turn that over to Jeanette Falvey, our chief digital officer, who's in, in charge of boston.gov uh, and, and all the web pages. Hi, everyone. Um, and sorry, as if on cue, my four month old uh, woke up just before this. So he's joining me for this answer. And if I do go off camera, it's just because I have to nurse. Um, but thank you for having me be a part of this today. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, this is a, a great question. Um, I'm so glad you asked. We follow, well, in 2010, um, the federal government put out plain language guidelines for all government websites to follow. And so we were happy to institute that across boston.gov and, and anything we are a part of um, that's distributed in print as well. So we follow that, that guidance and that's at plainlanguage.gov. Um, and we understand that we're fortunate in the Boston area to be able to target an eighth grade level, but we know that that certainly does not meet everyone's needs. Um, I've worked in my previous roles when I worked for the federal government in many communities in Massachusetts where, where fifth grade was actually more the average, and that's actually pretty consistent across the country. So we're aware that this still um, doesn't support everybody. Um, and it is definitely a, a an effort to get all of our content there. I will say that this is a constant, constant project um, with all of our partners across our departments. So um, we set that as our target goal, and um, because the way the team is set up um, and we're at the top of the editorial stream, uh, my team can ensure that we do meet this for any pages that we publish. So um, certainly a great question. It, do you have a clarifying? Yeah, I I see your do. Hand uh, and I don't know if I can, if the gavel is all pawn me or not, but I, I do wonder and, and just curious as we start thinking about how do we address the issue of literacy for folks who are struggling to read and write in their native language, um, what are we doing to utilize videos and audio files and other um, mechanisms to be able to engage and connect and provide information to folks? Uh, 
in ways that they can access it, right? So I'm just always thinking about information justice and just want to make sure that we're considering and exploring multiple ways to be able to connect people to the information that they're seeking. Absolutely. This this falls under something that I, I and the team are incredibly passionate about, and that's called user experience. So this is a, a practice across the digital um, world to really think through how people that are using the website are really experiencing it. Um, how can we make it more accessible? And that has a large part to play with everything we produce. We think through not just how it's written, how it's presented, what media we can use to make it more accessible. Um, exactly what you're saying. We have the digital storytellers on the digital team to help break things down um, wherever possible. You know, we use them in, in a variety of different ways where we have complex subject matter or, or longer term stories to tell about the city's work. We, we employ them to do that. We also uh, work with them to help elevate residents' voices and, and make sure that we're telling those stories as well about our community. But accessibility and user experience, this is the entire team's focus. Um, by making things at or below an eighth grade reading level wherever possible, that makes it easier to translate. Um, we've also employed the use of a, a small local firm here in Boston called Iterators. Um, they, they have been a wonderful partner in um, ensuring accessibility levels on Boston.gov. So we've done a lot of work this year to make sure that we truly meet WCAG AA standards for accessibility. Uh, we've partnered with the Disabilities Commission as well to make sure that we're prioritizing where their hearing constituents need the most support on the website. So we've done work like ensuring the color contrast on our visual media actually meets the needs of those with vision impairments. Um, we make sure that all, the entire website can actually be navigated with, with a keyboard. So we can't take anything for granted. We have to constantly be working to make sure that the website works for everyone. And accessibility is something that is never done, uh, but we are working at continuously. Thank, thank you for that. And I'm happy to partner with you all in that work. And um, well, just last thing that I'll say before also about gives me the gavel is uh, the use of symbols instead of the, the name of the language. Uh, um, flags are, are visual indicators of what things can be potentially translated upon. And so I think that, you know, just when we think about accessibility, um, the use of flags of different countries will help with folks if they're looking for translation but they don't know how to read, that a, a visual symbol could um, help with that as well. So that's it. And thank, thank you. you so much for all your hard work. And feel free to reach out to our office for any support. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Great. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Um, Councilor Flynn? Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bach. And I also wanted to highlight the exceptional work of the DUA team, uh, especially during the last during the last year, uh, this difficult year for everybody. Um, I held a hearing on digital equity in the past and wrote a op-ed with Councilor Mejia on this issue, um, working with Tech Goes Home. Um, but I understand that one in five people in Boston um, are struggling with digital access, digital equity related issues, especially as um, as Jeanette um, mentioned, our seniors, our our immigrant neighbors, um, immigrants. But I, um, you know, I represent the largest district with the residents living in public housing and um, and immigrants as well. What are we going to do to expand services for residents living in hard to reach areas or targeted demographics such as um, immigrants, such as BHA residents, uh, seniors, persons with disabilities? I'm always glad to hear you're doing a lot of good outreach on that. But what, what else can we do? And as a city council standpoint, I would really like to see us do more than what we what we are doing now, and if and if we are able to do more with more funding, you know, please let us know, and we can advocate for for funding in the budget. I certainly will. And, and I, again, I just want to I'll listen to your comments. I want to say thank you to the DUA team, David, Michael. I see you all there, Greg, Eddie, Jeanette. Um, I see my old friend Mike Lynch and my old friend uh, 
Glenn Williams down there on the corner. Good to see you, Glenn. Um, and that's all I have, Councilor Buck. I'll listen to the questions, okay? I mean, I'll listen to the answers. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Um, I mean, you know, I, I share your passion. And, you know, and, and as I said uh, in my opening statement and through some of the responses, this has been a very uh, difficult time uh, with people that are um, underserved or, or um, you know, very much uh, uh, have a, have do not have access to to broadband and and are not feeling connected uh, and and I can't imagine a, a worse situation than when you're in the middle of a pandemic and you're trying to get information and you're trying to understand what's going on. Um, so I mean, with that, Michael, I'd love to you know turn it over to you. I know that you're you you love to kind of talk about this topic. So I mean, I'll I'll, I'll pass it over to to uh, to our friend Mike Lynch. Thanks, David. And Councilor Flynn, thank you. You've been very attentive to the issue of, of digital equity and digital inclusion. Um, just to touch on some of the issues, I made quick notes as you were asking the question. I think, looking back, I think the last year and a quarter, 16 months, was was throwing Band-Aids at a problem. And we uh, we recognized a lot of it. We may not have recognized all of it. But now, as the, as the, uh, as the dust begins to settle and we move out of uh, the pandemic, and into the future, we're doing many things to address digital equity and digital inclusion. Uh, you see Sarah Figueroa here, she kind of champions a meeting that we meet once or twice a week with Age Strong, BHA, BPO, and BPS, talking about the different initiatives that they're doing. Housing Authority has surveyed all of its residents to kind of assess what their needs are, and they're working on a plan right now to do sort of a wireless distribution uh, off the rooftops of ho some housing developments to solve that problem. BPL is BPL used to be restricted on how they could spend money on Wi-Fi. They could only do it inside the walls of the libraries. That rule changed in the last year. So now they're putting, you know, they've already identified, I think, 170 uh, wireless access points that they're in neighborhood libraries that they're putting outside of the buildings. Um, Age Strong, Age Strong and uh, Emily Shea, have uh, surveyed the seniors and they have uh, identified with the social service agencies how they can come to the rescue. Again, it, it, it's not, uh, it's messy because it's not one simple answer anymore. Uh, EBB, the program I mentioned earlier, the Earl emergency broadband benefit, if folks can qualify and they can navigate the torturous process of application, that will spare them the expense of a connection in their home or a hotspot for their wireless. Um, as Sarah, I can turn it to Sarah Fig at some point here. The digital equity fund is a fund that the city has. Um, we threw $100,000 at it. Age Strong came back with another $150,000. We're going to give $250,000 to social service agencies directly tied to the constituencies that you're talking about, Councillor. And we, I think the last time we did this was about a year and a half ago. We got maybe, I don't know, 18 or 20 applications. This year, we got over 100. So budget has asked us, and I said, well, if you got that many, do you need some help? So they're looking to find more dollars to spend, but we know we're going to put $250,000 out the door this month. Uh, right, Eddie? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and then after that, I believe you are voting on as a council uh, sometime this month an additional million dollars that's also aligned with digital equity spending this year. I think in some respects, looking at what everything that has been done over the last 16 months, I think that we have been doing a lot of react and quick response work, and now we're planning for the future coming out the other side of it. I'm hoping we're successful. The one program I mentioned from the feds, the emergency broadband benefit, is directed at citizens. The other programs, the emergency connectivity fund and some of the uh, larger uh, APA funding can be used for a variety of things. Boston is a little bit handicapped using it for broadband because the rules say on both funds, if you have 25 megabit down and three up in a census block, uh, I see Dan Noyes is on here. He can correct me if I'm wrong. You cannot use this money to build a network. Even though we can't use it to build a network, we have resources out there. We simply have to extend them and push them out or provide directly to consumers. And I think that is what we're going to be focused on over the next year. There is a frightening amount of money available here. I think there's $3 billion inside the emergency broadband benefit. 
and there is seven billion inside the emergency connectivity fund. I can't get my head around those numbers, but we are trying to act fast because we're fairly certain if we don't, the providers will find a way to take all that money. <laughs> Sorry. Thank, thank you, Michael. And I see the uh, the chair has her gavel up, which means my time has expired. And I uh, just want to say thank you. If I if I did could add one more sentence, not not a question. Um, just something to think about. The Chinatown area is struggling with digital equity related issues uh, for a variety of reasons. But maybe offline, if we can talk further about this, um, that would be helpful. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely, Council. Okay. Th thank you, Council Buck. Thank you so much, Councillor Flynn. Um, and uh, next up is Councillor Flaherty. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thanks to David and to, to Mike um, for the work they've been doing doing uh, throughout the pandemic. Obviously, the public service announcements, et cetera, have been extremely helpful for our constituents. And I've been listening, so I know that the uh, asked and answered around uh, the digital divide and, and digital equity. Appreciate your efforts on that front. Uh, my concerns obviously remain the same as they've been in the past, is just making sure that we're able to attract, um, you know, um, and, and, and retain, um, you know, talented um, IT professionals and specialists. That's always been a challenge for us as a city. Uh, and so uh, making sure that we continue to, to reach out and attract uh, the talent to, to help us, um, you know, uh, be able to navigate, um, obviously, the technological advances. I know oftentimes folks will pass, could be a salary issue, and or uh, if we have someone, they tend to move on, and it seems to be salary-driven. So uh, to the best of our ability, uh, we need to continue to be able to attract uh, the talent. So I want to make sure that that stays on the forefront. Um, security also taking advantage of the latest technology to make sure that uh, all of our systems are secure and um, and uh, make sure that we're paying attention to that. And then lastly, we, we saw this, you know, we've the council has been asking for this prior to the pandemic, but we saw it throughout the pandemic, which is, you know, Know, allowing folks the ability to do to transact city business from home and or um, you know uh, through Zoom, so uh, that needs to obviously be factored in moving forward uh, as a municipality, and you know whether that's uh, you know watching a, a, you know a hearing and or uh, paying a ticket or being able to um, uh, to access some other information uh, and or. Uh, do some uh, some business with the city that needs to be on the forefront i think uh moving forward and uh hopefully we have technology to embrace that so i guess if there's anything that um you guys need from us or ways we can be helpful to make sure that we're staying on the cutting edge uh not only just with our equipment and in security but also with talent and i guess now's the opportunity to ask so um Appreciate the work you guys are doing, and just want to opine about the, those. Are, those have been, you know, my issues. Obviously, making sure that, you know, we're making City Hall um, and our city departments more user friendly, so that people are able to um, to do that, you know, to transact that business um, um, via their their uh, their computer versus having to come into downtown, sit in traffic, circle the block, get a spot, into a worse, get a ticket. Um, it's just sort of, uh, it's stuff that moving forward, we are able to, we should be able to eliminate, uh, given that we've been doing that throughout the entire pandemic and, uh, hopefully, uh, whatever systems, uh, and software and programs, uh, that you guys need to make that happen. I think that needs to be a priority. So thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll listen to comments from uh, Dave or Mike. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. I mean, in all very good points and all things that I'm very, very passionate about it. I mean, you just read right from the top three of my playbook. Um, attracting and retaining talent is uh, is always, you know, is always a challenge. Um, from being in the technology space for over 30 years, um, the thing I can tell you is that it it is challenging because technology folks do make some big salaries, um, and you know, and, and I think you had mentioned it that. You know, uh, attracting them is one thing, and that's the first hurdle. But retaining them, which is more kind of a a strategy and more ongoing, is is also a challenge as well. When you can't pay the salaries that the private sector pays, um, so you're really looking for people that are are really kind of uh, passionate about the work that we do um, and the impact that we have. Um, one of the things that brought me from, you know, being in the private sector for over 20 years to the public sector, being very close to the people that that uh, I'm making a difference in. Um, 
as for for cybersecurity, um, you know, being a former CISO myself, I mean, it is a it, it is an ongoing thing. There is there is no end state. Um, you know, as as good as you know, as, as good as you have it, tomorrow's another day with new threats, um, and it's in an, an ongoing challenge that um, it, it's. It's something that needs to be approached from a very layered uh, strategy, starting off really kind of with your end users, which are a bit of your first line defense and also one of your biggest risks, um, you know, around, you know, setting up complicated passwords and best practice about not sharing information, all the way to having really good service providers um, that, that are going to work with you to not only help in your defense, but also be there when you need to respond to, to an incident and then everything in between. So it is an ongoing challenge. It's something that, that Greg and I talk about a lot, um, you know, and, and it's a, you know, an ongoing process. Um, so, and, and as for the digital transformation that, you know, that is also something very important that, that I talk about as well a lot that there are multiple, and this is the way I've always kind of approached it, um, there are multiple generations out there that all want to interface with municipal government in a very different way. Um, you know, and, and I could, you know, just as kind of an example, I think of, you know, the banking industry. I can't remember the last time that I was actually at a physical bank. Uh, everything's kind of done online now and you you know and it's the same kind of transformation you know there are there are a segment of the population that still probably likes to come to city hall and there's a segment of the population that still wants to do everything online and then there is then there's the middle and making sure that you know as Jeanette kind of talked about as you focus on that experience and making sure that everyone has that experience with, with getting their business done and interfacing with municipal government um, in a very leveled uh, uh, view and, and focus on that user experience. Um, so that is part of that digital transformation, which is an ongoing thing as uh, we do still have a lot of services that are uh, needing to go online and kind of move away from you know a lot of the paper that we have here. Um, so this it's it's an ongoing work in progress, and that has been something that has been a you know in you know in last year's budget in this year's budget you know on that journey to to creating those user experiences for Bostonians. Mr. Lynch, you have uh, you have your hand up. Well, I, I couldn't resist, David. Uh, Councilor Flaherty, you raised an issue that uh, Councilor Braden raised as well, and that would be civic engagement. And and I couldn't not take the opportunity to say. Just this week, we're installing some equipment in the city council chambers with Kerry Jordan, as well as over at the bowling building and in room 801 and 901 to make sure that our, our hybrid model and our civic engagement platform is even better going forward. In addition, we've been working with city council staff and the city clerk's office on the new platform of legislative information management system, which uh, we're using the vendor called Granicus for respected across the country, and we have great hopes for its success. Thank you, Mike, on that. And uh, one thing I'll note is that Kerry Jordan is completely off limits to do it. How's that sound? He's he's uh, he's been my best hire uh, as as uh, as a city council as council president. So uh, he's done amazing work for us. Uh, just in general, he's uh, he's an amazing guy. But uh, particularly during the pandemic, uh, Kerry and the team that we have uh, really went above and beyond to make sure that uh, uh, city council business was was getting done, and obviously that we were uh, engaged um, and uh, getting testimony and uh, feedback from the public. So, and I know you guys work closely with, uh, with him. He's an absolute ace. Um, and I don't need to tell you guys about that. And, and one thing I could just say to David is that, you know, David, these are the opportunities you as obviously a department head as chair, you have the ability to turn around and to work with the council uh, through the administration to increase those salary ranges. So if you take a look at the salary ranges for the employees that uh, fall under your umbrella, you know, if they're sort of um, under market, if you will, then, you know, there's an opportunity there to have those conversations to give us uh, that information so we could potentially expand those ranges so that we could help you um, attract and or retain uh, the talent. That's a big piece of this as well. So that's that's one of our primary functions and our fiduciary responsibility to the residents and the taxpayers. And through this budget process, if those salary ranges are not adequate for you to 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 
be able to retain and attract the talent, then now's the time to kind of let us know so we can talk about maybe making some adjustments uh, moving forward with respect to the salary ranges we do it uh, by way of ordinance. So let us know if we can help you on that front. And thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, keep up the great work uh, for Do It, Dave and Mike. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Great, thanks so much, Councillor Flaherty. Um, I'll ask some questions now, um, and then um, because this is also the hearing on the PEG Access Fund, I'm looking forward to going to um, BNN and Tech Goes Home to hear from them, um, and uh, we'll take Councillor Second Round questions after that. Um, I, sorry, um, I guess since we were just talking about the personnel thing, um, picking up on that, uh, you know, David, how much, I mean, I'm aware from my my prior work in a large bureaucracy that sometimes, I mean, you know, for good reason within a unionized job context, we have job descriptions and such, but in a world in which you're dealing with innovation and technology, that can be really challenging because you can end up in a situation where you have workforces that are trained on and job descriptions that call for expertise in now obsolete systems, right? And now sometimes the person who manages the obsolete system is like the most valuable person to you because you're the only one still using the system. So I'm not knocking expertise in obsolete systems at the appropriate time, but um, but I do just wonder, are we, are we and the union working together um, with sort of sufficient speed to make sure that, you know, when we're posting and hiring um, we're doing it for the capacities that we need for managing the kind of like right up to this moment type of um, technological uh, things that we're managing. No, um, absolutely, you know, Madam Chair, I, and, and it's a great question. Um, and, and I'm going to kind of lean on uh, Eddie Pinkerton to fill a little bit in there as our, as our personnel officer. But um, it's as in technology, in, in the rate of technology changing, you know, it's very much focused on maintaining your current environment while you're building your future and making sure that you are having the right people with the right skills to not only maintain your current environment, but the right people as you look forward, as you may change platforms, as you may change software packages that understand and know going forward how they were, how they were, are, are how the environment is going to be changing, not only in Do It, but, you know, across the city of Boston. And we have an eye fixed on that. And, you know, and I, and I focus on Eddie, who probably, you know, between most of us, um, really kind of leans and in, in really works closely, uh, you know, with, with uh, you know, with, with OHR and with OLR uh, and, you know, with our, with our unions. So, you know, Eddie, if, if you have anything you want to kind of add to the importance of this topic. Yeah, I'll make a, a little bit of a plug for HR transformation. Um, so with the work that uh, they've been doing in OHR over the last, I think about two years now, um, I, I, we've seen a drastic improvement in, in the timing of, of how um, job descriptions are moving through. So the class and comp group has been fantastic to work with. Um, honestly, right now they're turning things around in almost a 48 hour <laughs> time period, which is, uh, uh, I, I feel almost unprecedented. Um, and then also OLR and, and the unions have been great to work with. I think we do have a unique challenge where uh, technology has changed so much of our job descriptions. Um, I mean, I've, I've pulled things from files that still have typewriter um, and it's a technology being used. So um, there's definitely a lot of modernization, but I, I think across the board, um, what we've seen is, is everyone is on board and helping us make those changes um, from OHR to OLR to the Union. So uh, I would say we don't have a lot of hurdles in in uh, in accomplishing what we want to, want to from a um, a, a talent and skills per perspective when it when it comes to updating our job descriptions. Okay. All right. Well, that's good to hear. Um, and in terms of that operational audit that didn't happen last year, what is the sort of timeline expectation on that? Um, Eddie, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, 
Yeah, we we uh, I would say we don't have a, a firm timeline right now. Um, we're we're going to be working with ANF um, to kind of solidify that. We're uh, I'd say right now for for Duet's perspective, we are very much focused on this return to work. Um, so I I would say internally we have not had the conversations of how we want to kick that off. But from a uh, I think from a, a leadership at ANF level, we are talking about the the reengagement of it. Um, but uh, unfortunately, right now, uh, Council Walker, we don't have a hard set timeline, but um, we'll definitely inform council as, as things progress on that matter. That's great. And um, the um, when we were talking with YEE on Tuesday, um, I guess that was two days ago now, uh, you know, it's been a continual um, focus of mine to figure out how we streamline the process in which they onboard, you know, several thousand youth each summer, um, because, I, you know, what my office ran one of the success link programs last summer and we just consistently see young people getting caught up in the queues. And, and sometimes, yes, you're chasing young people for their papers and that and that's a whole context, right? And I think because of the grant program, like because of that, we've moved towards the grant program option and such. But there are definitely significant moments where the young people have all their paperwork in and what we're waiting on are levers to be pushed on the city side. Um, and so I understand that uh, that there's been some work on kind of process mapping and trying to tighten it up between between do it and YEE and OHR, which I'm, I'm grateful for. I sort of, I want to both underscore the importance of that. And then also specifically, it came up that the question of being able to keep young people who did the summer success link program sort of in the system so that they could then start a year round job, which is a program that we're obviously ramping up and we think is an important complement. Um, so often like, you know, so often where you kind of lose young people who you're putting on a great track is in the failure of those handoffs. Um, and we've kind of set up a system where we inherently drop them for four months. Um, and uh, it sounded like there was still a kind of do it OHR sign off needed for a way to keep them in the system. So I wanted to ask, I don't know who on this call is the most appropriate person for that, but ask sort of where we are on that. I know this was a topic that we had touched on last summer as well is is to your point that they all kind of drop and then we lose, you know, we, we, we lose them, you know, kind of in that pipeline. Um, and I know that we are working with uh, with the A&F cabinet to to see about how we can, or at least from a system side, we keep them in the system. Uh, to make sure that we understand the process well enough to understand the the, the requirements in, in why that why they were dropping and to understand that if it's a technology barrier removing that uh, but I don't I don't know if Sarah or, or do you are you or Jeanef working on that with with YEE and with HR and in their the the summer programs so although I have not been working with them. I think this is a topic that we all feel strongly about. So I am more than happy to kind of figure out where that stands and get you an update. That would be great. I would very much appreciate it. Perfect. Um, and uh, just like a little bit of the sort of, you know, budget um, hat thing. So what's uh, looking at where we were, where do it was with it bending three quarters of the way through the year. Overtime is over. I think we all know why that is, um, but it looks like, but you do, so I'm assuming from your budgeting that you think that's a one-time pandemic bump because you're back down to last year's with your budget. And then telecommunications is way below being on pace for the year. What What's going on with that? Eddie, you want to take that one? Yep. Yeah, and, uh, and Councilor Buck, you're spot on, on on overtime. We are um, anticipating as we get back to normal operations that that, that should even out. Um, from a telecoms perspective, um, I think there, there's a little bit of a, uh, from our telecom team's deployment of VoIP, we're seeing a little bit of a cost reduction over uh, over time. So um, I think there's been some work internally to, to help us maintain costs there. Um, I, I can dive into a little bit more. I don't have a, a great answer on the top of my head uh, for um, any more specifics beyond the work that we've done around VoIP. Um, so happy to follow up with that. But um, I know uh, from um, my conversations with the managers in that group, um, there, there's been a lot of effort to help maintain costs and to and to reduce that across um, across this, reduce the impact across the city. Because there's also telecom charges um, that other departments have as well um, beyond just what, what Do It has in our budget. 
Got it. But you're saying that because we because we've implemented voice over internet protocol. Is that what it, that stands for? I forget. Uh, yes. I believe so. <laughs> um, voice over the data network. Yeah, yeah. So we're uh, with the plan that we are anticipating seeing a little bit of a reduction um, in costs overall um, from what we've uh, traditionally had. Um, I'm not the expert in that technology, but, so. But we, I see. But but we haven't yet. I mean, but we're not yet adjusting that aspect of do its budget downwards to reflect those savings. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So obviously, at some point, we should be doing that. Um, yep. Yep. Um, all right. And then, um, I guess I wanted to touch back Mike on, so like, I'll just, I sit on the soap soapbox before I appreciated your detailed answer in writing to me about the municipal broadband thing. I understand the point that we are not a like small town somewhere with nobody laying any fiber. Right. And so we're in a different we're a different spot. I still think that there are a variety of utilities in this country where the history was, oh, everybody starts thinking a railroad is a great idea. A whole bunch of rival private companies start laying railroads. Everyone's like, yeah, the private companies have that covered. Then it turns out railroads don't make any sense if you don't sync the time schedules. And eventually you end up with unified networks. Same thing with like water. Like if, if you told me, oh, we've got five private water companies running water to everybody in the city of Boston. Like at some point it's like, yeah, but everybody needs water. So I don't want them to be cut off from it if they can't pay for it. And so I just, at a kind of like century level view, I just think we're headed towards municipal broadband. I just, and it feels to me like it's like, are we one of the first or one of the last? Um, but uh, so that's more of a comment. And I think since I've run out of my own time, I'll leave that for a response from Mike uh, in the second round. Um, I think I, I would like to just come back a little bit on that and then also just land again on the point that you were making about those billions of dollars from the feds and sort of what we do to make sure that we get them for municipal purposes and not for the private side. Cause I do really want to have like a focus on that. And it sounds like it would be helpful for the council to understand a little better, even going into the ARP supplemental hearing next week. Um, so that was, I'll come back on those in my second round. Before we do the council second rounds, um, there is, like I said, this hearing is also about authorizing the PEG access fund. Um, Chief, I don't know if you or anybody on your team want to say a quick word about that fund from Dewitt's perspective, um, but then I want to go to uh, Glenn Williams from BNN and Dan Noyes and his team from Tech Goes Home for a few comments. I'm, I'm confident that Mike Lynch wants to have an opening statement with the, with the PEG funding. Mike, take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, we've been down this road before. We have a couple of fantastic community partners here in Tech Goes Home and Boston Neighborhood Network. Uh, the funding which we receive and, and uh, you accept and expend through the 21st Century Access Fund is funding that comes from the fees that subscribers pay to cable TV. It's kind of a legacy thing. There are less subscribers today for cable TV than they used to be, but we are able to be very creative in funding these agencies and helping to sort of, I think, bridge the digital divide um, with those dollars. Uh, the only thing I might add is if you have cable TV and you're thinking of shutting it off, do not, because you are supporting digital equity in the city of Boston. Great, thank you so much, Mike, for those comments. And uh, and uh, in terms of what you're supporting, I will uh, go now to Glenn Williams from BNN. Glenn, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and uh, your fellow city councilors. It's uh, it, uh, like Michael said, I'm Glenn Williams. I'm the general manager of Boston Neighborhood Network, Boston's nonprofit charitable public access TV and radio provider, and fully equipped digital media center. I am proud to be with you today on behalf of BNN in support of this order to fund the public educational and government access service. That's PEG, known as PEG, let me say PEG. Uh, that BNN provides uh, Boston's cable viewers, radio listeners, and residents. Um, through, the, through the dedication of our staff, BNN has fulfilled its commitment to our mission to provide a voice for our citizens to inform the people of Boston with every aspect of the issues connected to living safely. We provided our membership with free Zoom classes 
to afford them the opportunity to continue their programming on both television and radio through this long pandemic. We've, we've applied for a grant so that we can get some hotspots because what we've discovered here is that digital equity, everyone kept talking about digital equity. We, we, have, we still have people who are, if they're on their, on their computer or something and Aunt Claire upstairs answers the cell phone, it's a battle on who is actually going to be using that. So uh, we've, got, we've made a move in that, in that particular direction. Um, our, our partnership with the administration and teachers of the Boston Public Schools has provided our scholars uh, a, a valuable tool to enhance the challenges associated with remote learning. We connected students with over 900 hours of programming produced by those teachers and our staff, almost half of which was live production, live programming into the home like uh, uh, extra help. So students who are coming up with, with their, whatever kind of tests they can dial into BNN Live and have a live conversation with a math teacher from the Boston Public Schools to discuss the things that they may not be understanding. Uh, we recognize this success through, uh, through the thousands of video on demand views registered on our website. And with the live coverage of the Boston Arts Academy graduation at Fenway Park on June 17th, we look forward to continuing this partnership for years to come. With the additions of, with the addition of institutions like BU Wheelock, they have a social injustice and equity web, webinar series that we run. Friendship First, which is a seniors living program, Mass College of Art and Design, and the, and the contributions from Boston, uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center from their Center of Virology and Vaccine Research. We continue to inform our neighborhoods with the information needed to make the decisions to enhance their life. Because of the COVID problem that we've all gone through, one of the things that we've discovered nationally is, is the appreciation and the need for your PEG access stations. Uh, I, I sit on several chairs, some of them that are nationally, and that's some of the things that get talked about all the time. I know that some of you have been on a variety of programs at BNN, some of you with me, and uh, I will say to uh, Councilor O'Malley, uh, I will miss you, sir. It was always a fun time to call and ask you to sit in and and keep get, talk me off the roof sometimes. I appreciate everything that you've done. <laughs> I hope you will recognize the enormous contribution BNN has made to the community of Boston. I've been associated with Boston Neighborhood Network for six, 26 years as a television and radio host, producer, member of the board of directors, uh, WBC and radio manager, and now the general manager. I've seen this organization grow to the award-winning Access Media Center it is today. I'm not gonna list all of the awards, but one I'm incredibly proud of this year is that we have won a national award with the Alliance for Community Media as the most outstanding community radio station in the country. And we're going to be receiving that award later on this month. It's, it's very, very rewarding to see that we get that kind of recognition because the cats here work really hard to make sure that we put out a quality product. Many of our memberships, being in media, I mean, with, 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 with our many memberships, uh, BNN Media will also be available to provide engineering and technical support to the Boston PEG channels, including Boston City TV, City TV, and Boston Kids and Family TV, and of course, BC, WBCNR radio station. We will be opening soon. Last Tuesday, our, mem our, our staff came to work. They're at their desks and they're working. We've been remote we're working remotely. We're getting our building ready for members. We have a huge plan that's already being put folded into place. And by, by the middle of July, we're expecting to have these studios open and running efficiently. On behalf of BNN, I'd like to thank the city council, Mayor Kim Janney, Chief of Operation David, thank you very much for everything that you do. Uh, Mike Lynch and everyone at Do It, and Justin Petty, the board president, for your commitment in sustaining BNN Media, a place for Boston residents to create local programming for the good of their neighbors. 
Without the support of the city of Austin to help its cable and license and radio licenses, we would not be able to serve so many Boston residents and nonprofits over the many years. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Glenn, and thank you so much um, for your service in informing the public. We really appreciate it. Um, and I think we're all fans of BNN on the council. Um, next up, I'm going to go to Dan Noyes from the uh, Tech Goes Home team. And Dan, I see that you've also got Marvin Benet with you. Um, so obviously, uh, look forward to you all sharing the floor. So take it away. Yeah, I'm going to let Marvin, uh, for those of you that know me, this is very painful, but I'm going to let Marvin talk more than me. Um, I, but Mike, did you hear Councillor President O'Malley say he wants to increase funding 50% at the beginning yeah. of this meeting? I, I think I heard that. What is that? So, so David, David, I'm going to call you after this so we can have a conversation about that. But uh, I'm at so least, excited to be. Dan, at, at least 50%, but it might be more if uh, Marvin can show what pocket square he's sporting today. Oh. <laughs> Don't get Marvin going on pocket squares, Councilor. All right, all right. Order, order, order. Uh, no, thank you for being here. I am going to introduce you to Marvin Vinay, who is our uh, one of our latest hires at Tech Goes Home, um, uh, our, our new digital, excuse me, uh, director of advocacy, which is a, a, a new opportunity for us, uh, a big step for us, I think, moving forward. So with that, um, I'm turning it over to Marvin and his, his self-made pocket square, Councilor O'Malley. Greetings. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairwoman and uh, the rest of the uh, council. Um, as it's already been shared, my name is Marvin Vinay. I am the Director of Advocacy for Tech Goes Home, a leading nonprofit in Greater Boston devoted to addressing digital inequity. I'm testifying this morning in favor of this order to fund the PEG Access Fund. This fund provides critical support for connecting individuals and families with digital devices, internet connectivity, and the skills training they need to overcome barriers, access essential services online, and capitalize on opportunities presented by the digital world. First of all, I'd like to thank the City Council for your attention to the digital inequity over the past year. Digital inequity impacts individuals and families across Boston, especially those already facing disproportionate barriers resulting from poverty, homelessness, uh, digital access, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, food insecurity, systemic racism, and more. COVID-19 has also worsened persistent disparities in digital access and reinforced how important it is that we work collectively to ensure equitable, sustainable access for everyone in Boston. Digital devices and internet connectivity, plus the ability to use them effectively are essential to participating in school, finding and maintaining employment, accessing telehealth, connecting with loved ones, and more. And in response to the pandemic, TGH adapted its work to expand access to our programming while keeping staff, trainers, and learners safe. In addition to continue to provide each learner with a digital device and internet access, we launched a distance learning program that mirrors our in-person courses, created a COVID-19 resource page on our website and developed a live webinar series for TGH learners and the general public. This would not be possible without steadfast support from the city of Boston and the funding that comes through the PEC Access Fund. Working with more than 180 community partners, we prioritize low income and underserved populations aged three to 94, including people without technology at home who are un or underemployed, have limited English proficiency, are living with disabilities and are experiencing housing instability. Of the population that TGH serves, 77% of TGH households have incomes under $35,000. 90% are people of color. Nearly 50% are all from immigrant families, and 34% of the adult learners are unemployed. In the past five years alone, TGH programming has served over 21,000 learners and distributed nearly 14,000 new computers. This year, our goal was to serve 5,500 learners through our programs. Though we have worked tirelessly to build our philanthropic support to marry the city's uh, essentials commitment, we need significantly increased support from both the public and private sector if we are going to end this inequity effectively. With the support of the council and approval of the funding in the PEC Access Fund, 
We are eager to continue this partnership and better the lives of Boston neighbors. To learn more about our work, please, as you all know, visit techgoeshome.org or feel free to reach out to me at any time at marvin at techgoeshome.org. I'd like to thank you all for all that you do for the residents of our city. And Dan and I are here to answer any questions that might be uh, at your desire. Thank you. Great. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, Marvin and Dan. Um, and again, to Glenn, we really appreciate all of you guys. Um, and I did want to get you all in so that counselors could ask their next round of questions. Um, before we do that, I just want to let, we do have one member of the public who is waiting to testify. And I think rather than making him wait for a whole second round, I'm going to let him come and testify. Um, and then we will uh, jump to the top of the order for questions. Great. Um, so, uh, um, so, Mr. Mr. Sean Riley, if you'd like to give your public testimony now, just ask you to identify yourself, um, state your residence or affiliation, and uh, and make your comment. Certainly. Can you hear me, Councilor Bob? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you. My name is Sean Riley. I'm a resident of the Fenway neighborhood. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, my counselor, Councillor Bach, and her staff for advising me uh, about today's hearing and encouraging me to provide the testimony. Um, so I, I wanted to speak today because there's a massive security issue with the city of Boston's new Be Local app. Um, so I've worked in the tech industry for over 15 years, but to kind of explain it as quickly and simply as possible for those who aren't tech savvy, uh, I'll, I'll kind of give a summary of what's happening. Um, but at that point, I urge the city, the counselors here and the uh, Department of IT to immediately suspend this app and to fix the security issue uh, until it's been resolved. So a uh, brief background for those who don't know, the city's new Be Local app and the way that I found out about it, it was reported on The Globe and Boston.com about a month and a half ago. Uh, it apparently uses federal COVID funding to help support local Boston restaurants and businesses with a cash back program. It's a great program. I love that. I, I think that's a great way to do it. But here's the problem. The city chose to partner with an app company called Kolu, which is not based in Boston, to build the Be Local app. And the way that the app tracks purchases uh, for the cashback program is the problem. They basically had two options. So either you use some kind of digital punch card to reward uh, people that spend at Boston businesses, or you track it through debit and credit card. Uh, information and they chose to track it through debit and credit card and I actually personally also agree with that there are many other programs out there right now that do similar things uh, the problem and this is the major security issue is that within the app they made a horrible mistake on how they implemented the collection of this credit and debit card information um, here's what the app does rather than ask for credit and debit card numbers which is what many other apps in the network, uh, reward networks is a perfect example. Uh, if any of you have uh, you know, these programs through your uh, airline, uh, you can sign up and get free points when you stay at, at certain restaurants. Um, but what this does is that it asks for the, uh, rather than the 16 digit number, uh, it asks for uh, the username and password for all of your financial institutions via this third party platform called Plaid. So for a reward app, again, designed to help give back to Boston businesses, the city of Boston is currently endorsing an app that through a third party asks people to give them their username and password to do this. It, it is a terrible idea. It should frankly never have been allowed to launch. I, I'm, I'm very disappointed that it's kind of you know come to that. Um, and, and here are kind of the two reasons, and again, I'm speaking from the tech space. You should never, ever, ever be asked to give your username and password to a third party. And this kind of breaks two fundamental internet security rules. And again, these are for people that are more tech savvy as opposed to those who aren't. Um, you should never give your credentials to a third party because you have no idea what they're doing. Within an app, it's not like going on a website where, for instance, if you type in chase.com, you can see there's that green little lock, you know that your connection is secure. Within an app, you have no way to know this for sure. Um, and again, this uses actually an iframe platform within the app. So there's no way to know whether it's secured or unsecured. And this again is separate from whether or not it should even be asked to begin with. 
The second part of this is the Plaid platform actually requires this password to be stored in plain text because they have to do it on the back end to log people in. So again, today, the city of Boston has approved an app asking for financial institution username and password through a third party. And this is exactly what scammers around the world ask people to do. They say, you know, through apps, through malicious websites, give us this information. They pretend to be Chase. They pretend to be Bank of America. And we'll, we'll help you with this. And again, we, you know, in the tech community have always said never, never, never give username and password info, particularly to financial institutions. And again, for those of you looking within the app, they even use the logos of the banks, implying that it is secure or somehow partnered with them, which it isn't. So there's one last thing I'll say very quickly. And again, I'm happy to, to take questions, but here's the information. In addition to the massive security issues, here's the other big problem. The Plaid platform on its own privacy website admits it takes your account information, financial institution name, account name, account type, account ownership, your branch number, the account number, the routing number. It will store all of this. It stores your credit account number, your due dates, balances owed, payment amounts, dates, transaction history, credit limit, repayment, loan accounts, loan redue dates, repayment status, balance, um, identifiers about the account owners, including name, email address, phone number, date of birth, and address, all of this just to try to use a rewards app. Um, so again, I strongly encourage you to take a look at this. And in the meantime, this app needs to be shut down. The city should not be supporting and endorsing an app that is asking for this kind of information, particularly uh, for a rewards program. But again, I would love to get the Department of IT to kind of give feedback and hopefully admit this is an issue and shut it down until it can be fixed. Thank you, Sean. And Sean, just from a disclosure perspective, do you um, do you work for a for a company that works in this space? No, I do not. I, I'm actually a research director. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just say I I did ask a question about this at um, the uh, hearing for the Office of Economic Development, and I know that what I heard from Natalia there was that Plaid was partnered with the banks, and that um, you know it, that it was. Uh, it, it was, it, the city did consider it a secure platform, but I think obviously Sean's raising it to do it. And it's another thing that it would be good for us to address here in the public space. Since, as I said to Natalia at the time, I do think that people are not, I think there's two separate questions, right? There's the security of the credentials. Um, and I guess I was somewhat put at ease by conversation on that. And then there's the question of just people are not used to that kind of login yet on lots of things. And so we'd love to hear a little bit from do it on that. So, I mean, all, all very good points. Thank you, Mr. Riley, for, for bringing this up. And, and this is something that I'll address with, with, with DOE. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the way it, it has been kind of laid out, it's, it's not only pulling those credentials, it's also how they're, how they're being stored, how they're being used. Um, so I, I, I get that this is, you know, a, a, a concern. Um, I will definitely get together with because it, you know, it does come out from the Department of Economic Development and make sure that it is remediated and addressed. Um, so that is, that's my commitment at this point. So I will, I will dig into this and, and find out. You know, I, I understand when it launched um, um, that there was some. Uh, well, I, I will address and, and circle back with the with the council shortly and, and get a path forward to remediation. Great, thank you, really appreciate that. Um, and then I've got one question on the PEG access fund and then I'm going to the top of the order, which I think is, uh, I think of who's here it is Councillor O'Malley. Um, but uh, I, I just wanted to know 4.4 million is what we're appropriating here. Um, I think that's pretty consistent with what it's been in years past. So to Dan's point, it's not increasing. Um, so I sort of wanted to ask the question of, of why we've kept it flat, how that ends up being the number each year and whether there's any room to adjust it. Yes, uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, the direct source of funding uh, is, is really peg support fees that come from subscribers to cable TV. Uh, I, I think we may have mentioned it in this hearing before, but. The, the trend of people right. who are subscribing to, to cable TV is going down. 
We have balanced that out for the last few years with new payments from Verizon, who, as a new entry, kind of matches commitments previously made by Comcast. So we'll be getting extra money, if you will, um, from, Com uh, from Verizon. And in addition, we foresee that maybe happening next year. So there's been a little bit of an offset, and there's probably been more money, it may be in next year, more money coming in than will be expended. We're not quite sure yet because we don't know we really don't know the pace of disconnects from cable TV. That really is what drives it. Uh, we have been fortunate since this fund started, I think, four years ago. Uh, prior to that, we did made more direct payments through the Boston Charitable Trust. But since this fund started four years ago, um, we have had these one-time contribution opportunities that have kept the amount matching what has been spent in, in years prior. But I don't know how sustainable that is going forward. Right, got it, okay. Yeah, and obviously there's important work that sometimes we end up supporting out of the general fund, right? Because if the, if the source just isn't there, but that's great to understand. Um, and now Council President O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, I stayed on because I wanted to follow up on this very line of questioning. Um, you know, I, I was not totally joking when I said do its total budget should increase dramatically by as much as 50%. I know that's not realistic, but um, when we think about what we're asking all of you to do, not only as it relates to building out a more sustainable network, not only as it, it relates to uh, addressing the digital divide, but just how we are all so much more dependent on technology. There is an argument to be made that we need to fund this a hell of a lot better. So that's my question, Mike, as it relates to cable TV subscribers, and, and I am one who cut the cord this year, I must admit. Um, and but but I will happily pay a surcharge to my uh, my Verizon bill, which which is my internet. Um, so that's my question. What would we need to do to sort of change that with either Comcast, uh, Verizon, RCN to allow for that funding stream to continue and grow? Um, people are moving away from traditional cable television by and large. You're going to see that increase as streaming services, you know, become more numerous than television networks. So is that state legislation that creates that? Is it city legislation? Can you walk me through that and also walk me through how we can change that going forward to make sure that BNN, the tech goes home, that all these other incredibly vital services remain fully funded? Thanks, Councilor O'Malley. Um, huh, thanks for the invite. Now that I think about it, all of this is guided by the 1996 Telecom Act. Yeah, that's federal stuff, and it's yeah, it's federal, it's Congress, and I don't see it getting revisited. If it did get revisited, we would probably lose the stream of funding that we currently have. Uh, I think Eddie can attest to the fact that I'm like a revenue junkie, probably the only guy in City Hall who just is always chasing the dollar. I, the future is uncertain. Um, yeah. Cable TV was and is regulated. Broadband, what everybody accepts now, is not regulated. There is no fee attached to it. So there is not a revenue stream to compensate for it. I, I, some of it is a situation of let's leave well enough alone at the federal level. I fear that if we change it, um, and there have been some attempts, there was an attempt by the cable industry just last year, FCC issued something called a 621 order. It will reduce some of our funding. We watch this vigilantly to sort of protect ourselves from it. We change our license with the cable operators in order to make sure some of our money is protected. I, I'm not really fully certain what the future brings. Yeah. I can say that for the next couple of years, I think we're okay. Five years out, I don't have any idea. It's a fluid situation. I don't see federal law changing. I don't see compensation for use of the public right of way but in lo by local uh, by broadband providers or cable providers or wireless providers changing for the benefit of local government anytime in the, in the next few years. Well, that, that's good. That's good intel. And again, your, your institutional knowledge in this space is, is unrivaled and so important, Mike. Um, well, what by, the time, by the time it's leaving, I'll be retiring because I, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, <laughs> my, uh, Mike Lynch can't retire. Come on. <laughs> exactly. Um, is there a way that we could, and I guess I'm spitballing here, but I'm, I'm really curious because I think that this is a crucial issue that we really should be focused on as it relates to um, some of the infrastructure, the, the, the poles, the, 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 um, is there any mechanism for the city to... And again, I don't want to suggest that we should 
you know, go after the, the providers that would then pass the cost on to the customers. We want to make sure it's affordable. One of the reasons why I cut cable because it was no longer affordable. Um, is there a way though that we could have a more dedicated, more reliable revenue stream using city tools? So I don't know, it, would be, it wouldn't be excise taxes necessarily, but some way to go after some of the telecommunication uh, giants? Councillor, I honestly don't know. Uh, there was a council hearing on that about 20 years ago, and I got my head handed to me, so I'm not going, I'm not going back. <laughs> well, I tell um, you what, I, I, will, I will pass this along. We will, uh, you and I will have to go to Harry soon, and uh, anyone else that wants to join can, and we can figure this out, because I think this there's a real opportunity here. And, and you know, I, I remember, I actually had a constituent reach out to me around this time last year saying, why the heck am I still being charged the fee from my cable provider for um, for sports when there have been no uh, sports over the last no live sports. Yeah. And we were able to work with some of the providers to get refunds. So I just want to make sure that, that as we talk about the important programming that this city is is working with with great partners uh, like Tedco's Home, like BNN, like so, like the, the men and women of, of Do It, we want to make sure that we don't leave money on the table. And we also want to make sure that these giant corporations that are making billions of dollars, uh, well, not in Boston, but millions of dollars, certainly, of Boston customers are paying their fair share to make sure that we can um, continue this programming. So we will f follow up on that. But um, thank you again all for your, for your great work. Council, Council can I, just, can I make a quick comment? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Glenn. Sorry. No, that's all right. I just wanted to say that there's a something that, and I've talked to Mike about this, is that the the funding we get from the city of Boston not only supports our programs, but it is a it is a catalyst for more funding. So, for example, if you went back four or five years ago with the city's million dollar funding, that that basically was almost 100 percent of our budget. Well, today, even though the funding has remained the same, it's about 25 percent of our budget. So our budget in four years has grown from about a million to four million dollars. And a lot of that not only is because of the incredible work of the, the, the city and the people who work for Techos Home and beyond, but it, corporations and foundations, when they see cities investing and municipalities investing in projects, they love it. Corporations especially love it. So the bigger that that pot gets to be, it opens different pockets of money for organizations like ours. So if the city were to come in and say, all right, we're giving you $5 million this year or whatever that money might be, that means I can go to a much bigger corporation or a much bigger foundation and say, hey, the city of Boston's putting this in. Can't you match that? So it's not just about serving more people. It's also about leveraging that support for more support in the private sector. That's well said. Thank you, Dan. If I, if I can just for one second just um, share with you that uh, when I took over two years ago, a lot of the equipment and a lot of the work that we were, a lot of the material we were working with was old NASA stuff, antiquated and old. And you know what I mean by NASA, all of these screens and, and, and stuff like that. And in order to keep our membership and, and, and attract more membership, <clears throat> we've had to upgrade a lot of our stuff. And technology flies, as Dan knows. And to be competitive with, with everybody else around, we've had to make some tough decisions and upgrade some things. Um, with obviously, if there was more available funding from some other source or something else, from some other kind of grant to fill out, let me know. I mean, I'm more than happy to, 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 to sign on for that. And, and the other thing that we have down here is we have years and years of, of stuff that was on tape that needs to be archived and critical stuff of mayor kevin white now who is anyone anyone here work with him before literally stuff of his that is from our news that are sitting in tapes downstairs that need to be archived so we've been working with umass boston and wgbh to do that but that's a huge grant to get that done that we can't spend because we have to I'm just, I just wanted to put that fact out there, that we're a digital media center who, could, who needs to have some, you know, push in, in the new direction. That's all. I didn't mean to take so much time. No, I, th I think you're right. And BNN, you do so much with so little. Upgrades are crucial. Um, but we can't upgrade Joe Heisler. He's got to... Uh, he's got to <laughs>
to see the top of the line. Joe's working from, Joe's working from home. Of course he is. I love it. Um, that's all I have, Madam Chair, but I think Mike has his hand Yeah, up. I think Mike had a word he wanted to add as well. I apologize. I just wanted to jump off of what Jan Noyes was saying. Uh, that's why I stress so much on the emergency broadband benefit. If we can get citizens, our residents, who are in need to hook into these services and get this, that's uh, that's an expense we will no longer be absorbing as we quickly did during the pandemic. The next fund coming down the line is the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Big fund, but the city's strategy since we began to build the city network 15 years ago was to become E-rate eligible. We as a city department provide services to schools and libraries and then get reimbursed with USAC, federal E-rate reimbursement dollars. That saves us a tremendous amount of money and it reduces our cost tremendously. Apparently, under ECF, we can expand on that. We are trying to explore that right now. We're not exactly sure what we're eligible for because I, I think, Councillor O'Malley, as you well know, uh, local government is not the last party in the room when these laws are made. So there were a lot of, a lot of uh, not loopholes, but opportunities were closed to cities and towns. I, I don't know what better way to say it. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, um, Matt. And, and if I can just follow up on that, Mike, so the when you say expand the E-rate, like, is there a world in which we could provide that to our residential? I, I used to work at BHA, so I am always yes. thinking about, and BHA always has to negotiate these deals with Verizon and Comcast, and they're a huge headache. And, and so, like, and I know they've been a big focus of our pandemic efforts, so, I'm curious, like, you know, does, is there a possibility of crossing that Rubicon? Only, I think, Councillor, only to the extent that we can be creative about the fact that BHA residents are students in our schools or members of our library system. In other words, the, the hook has to be through the libraries or through the schools. It's not through the BHA. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think the Councillor supported all along uh, our effort, we're using Crown Fiber to continue to expand our network. We're coming to the completion of that big phase of this project. And the council, eyes open, was aware that we were connecting all of the Boston Housing Authority developments. And that was a huge benefit, I think, that the city gave to the Housing Authority. Now the idea is how best to use it. Okay, great. Um, I want to let Councillor Julia Mejia go. She's next. So, yeah. Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. It's great to see um, Tech Goes Home. Uh, we, you know, as you all know, we're a big supporter of your work um, and have worked in collaboration in a number of different capacities throughout COVID. So I'm just curious, where do you, um, this question is for um, Tech Goes Home, where do you see yourselves in the next five years? And um, what role can the city play in helping to support that vision? Dan, yeah. I have so many thoughts. <laughs> I don't know, Marvin, do you want, do you want to? No, no, go ahead, Dan. I'll, I'll kick, I'll come back on you. Well, I think one, I think um, uh, all, it, all it took for people to pay attention to digital equity was a pandemic, right? So uh, let's hope we don't have any more of those. But the other thing is, I think, uh, acknowledging that digital equity is a racial justice issue. So when you really dive into the data uh, of who's not connected, uh, it is it is the groups that we talk about. It, it, you know, a, a white senior, 23% uh, of white seniors can't connect to telemedicine, while 60% of black seniors and 71% of Latinx seniors cannot connect to telemedicine. Uh, a black student is twice as likely not to have internet at home than a white student. Uh, a black worker is twice as likely not to have basic digital literacy skills than a white worker. So you're looking across health and, and jobs and education. So in terms of where we're going, I hope there's more recognition that this isn't like a tech issue. This is an equity issue. That's what we're talking about here. Also, I think in terms of where we're going, um, the idea that what we do as, just as tech goes home, can touch so many aspects of people's lives. You know, our just our school-based family program, for example, gets parents into schools, and every study on the planet shows that a kid's grades will improve if a parent's involved in, in their child's education. So my hope would be that 
uh, there'd be continued investment for municipalities, that the state would finally get involved in this, the Commonwealth would, would jump in, and Mike mentioned these funds from uh, the federal government. I think you used the word you're afraid of them, Mike. I'm not afraid of them I'm not all. afraid of them. <laughs> they can come. They can all come to me. I'll spend it all tomorrow. Um, but really look at this as a long-term strategy to ensure that all residents of the city of Boston have equal opportunity to the jobs, to the healthcare, to the education that they all deserve. From our perspective, we're really proud of the work we do, but it is a drop in the bucket compared to the problem. There's 140 or so thousand people in Boston that live in poverty. Marvin mentioned earlier we're serving 5,500, 6,000 people this year, and we're proud of that, but we need to get to the point where we're serving 50,000 people so that way we can really see real change, uh, not only in Boston, uh, but across uh, the, the country. So I don't know, Marvin, if you have anything you want to add to that, uh, me rambling. Sorry, Counselor. No, I think Dan's statistics are satisfactory and give us a real clear picture of why this uh, work is necessary. I think what we're looking for in municipal partners are to um, stretch us and create uh, opportunities for us to identify other funding sources so that we can expand this work. Uh, as Dan mentioned, we're looking at, you know, exceeding the 6,000 6, uh, learner marker. But why can't we jump and leap beyond that? There's a huge demand out there for students and families that are looking for support that with your support as um, legislators, we can actually make some real change and not just be the, the talk of the town, but actually be action oriented. So I'm looking to advance that sort of work with your support and hoping that um, we can just, you know, formulate a, a partnership, and 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 we can do we can do the the band aids around making sure that people have access. But we also need to address the fact that uh, bandwidth is important as well. And so, if it's not one thing for just a family to have um, internet ca internet capabilities, but it's another thing for them to have the bandwidth so that everyone in a household is able to execute their work and their responsibility simultaneously um, and no one's left behind. So thank you. And on that point, well, if I could you. add, so we give the hotspots out too, like we've worked in partnership with Mike for many years. The average data usage on our hotspots that we give out is 300 gigabytes per month. So T-Mobile has like a, a student plan that they provide for people. Their limit is 100 gigabytes a year. So the Marvin's point, we need to really start thinking about this 25, 30, 50 megs down. It's, it's just not sustainable. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and to that point, I'm just curious, um, and I'm not sure David uh, might be able to kind of give us some insight. You know, I think about these free Wi-Fi um, hotspots. They're usually in touristy areas. Um, and I'm, and I know that we've been talking a lot about how do we expand it? Look, right now my internet is, um, unstable. I hope that you can still hear me. Um, but I, I'm just really curious about what, you know, what the city is doing to be more equitable in terms of sharing the reach around our Wi-Fi. And also, um, what are we doing as a city, or what can we be doing um, to hold these uh, providers more accountable, uh, to be more fair and just in terms of their pricing, um, in terms of their bandwidth, and in, ter in terms of um, their offering in low-income communities? I mean, I think that it's great that we're opening up our doors and creating space for them to do business here in the city of Boston, but at some point, we need to also um, set some standards and what it looks like to do business here equitably and the role that they play in doing their fair sh um, share um, to ensuring that everyone has access to high-speed um, broadband access. And um, what, does it, what does that accountability look like and what can we do um, to be a little bit more aggressive around that? Thank you, Council Mejia. Uh, Mike, do you want to talk about our Wicked expansion and then talk about kind of the, the competition with the providers and the, 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 the strategy around kind of broadband connectivity in, in the city of Boston? Sure. Um, Councillor, I'm guessing what you're talking about is what, what we know as Wicked Free Wi-Fi, but there are probably four different platforms of free wireless service provided by the city in Boston. And, and the, as a general rule of thumb, 
they are connected or close to city buildings. Wherever there is a city building, we've got Wi-Fi and we're looking to grow it. That's that's what the additional money, I believe, in the budget this year is, is helping to contribute to. The fact that we have are finishing a major phase of the fiber deployment for our city network assists us greatly there. It means that we have approximately 330 city buildings connected where we can project ourselves out wirelessly from those buildings. But it's kind of close to those buildings. And that's what we're restricted by right now. Um, I think Wicked Free Wi-Fi is maybe 300 access points across the city, and they are they're spread out across the city. It's mostly community centers and schools and uh, fire departments and police stations that are in neighborhood business districts. That's kind of where we have been putting it right now. The libraries have put out another 300 units on their own. The schools and most of the schools currently are inside. I think the schools have 6,000 access points. That law I mentioned to you, the new funding law, the emergency connectivity fund, there is an opportunity within that for us to expand and for the libraries and the schools to put wireless outside their campuses and make it sort of a neighborhood hotspot. That is sort of what we're looking for. I, I don't want to overpromise. I mean, the, the industry spends a lot of time looking at what we can do and trying to prevent us from doing it. But that's, yeah. that's where we are. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And before I get the gavel, I just wanted to also make note that we have a lot of higher ed institutions here who are occupying a lot of space in the city of Boston. And I think that there is an opportunity to also um, invite them to be better partners um, in this journey alongside. And I don't know if we're already doing that, but if we are great, um, we need to do more of it. And if we're not, then we need to also uh, consider that as a community benefit because everyone should be benefiting um, from access to Wi-Fi. And I think that our higher ed institutions could be a better partner in that space as well. I think it's a wonderful idea, Councillor. It takes what they call one more SSID card inside every access point to open it up to the community or which they serve, yeah, which they live cool. in. Well, let the higher ed education institutions know that I'm coming for them on that one. <laughs> Very it's good. It's on record. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Great, thank you so much, Councilor Mejia. Um, I, I have a few more questions on my part, and I did just want to also um, put back on record, there were two questions that I cut off from Councilors Campbell and Braden, and they had to go, but they I wanted to get your answers on the record. So one was um, Councilor Campbell's third question that we didn't get to was about, you know, she was talking about the, the hearing that we had about the police department's data and the need to analyze it, and the fact that we just had this hearing where YE is, is hiring a new person to kind of Figure out lessons learned and how to um, how to build a workforce development pipeline. You know, using more of their data. And so I think her question was sort of how how is DoIt thinking about its role supporting departments in sort of data analysis in this world of big data and um, you know trying to turn around and be recursive about what we're doing. Uh, and you know, what are the barriers to kind of supporting city departments on that front? So on the on the data front, it's um, you know, and especially you know through through the the last fifteen plus months that we've went through 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 COVID, you know, talking about you know infection rates and hotspots in the city, and and now you know uh, many other things that we're using our, our data for to to be to to drive our decisions, support our decisions. Um, the way. The way that we are looking at it right now is that right now it's very a collaborative approach. Uh, we do the the city and all its various departments do share a, 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 a quite a bit of information with uh, with uh, our our data and analytics team, but there's always a, an opportunity to expand on that. Uh, and really kind of look holistically. Anything around kind of big data analysis or big data, uh, doing big data pipelining work, um, the more you kind of put into it, the more you'll get out of it. Um, so this is a, you know, I'm in multiple conversations across the city around to open really kind of the, a lot of that up uh, to our chief data officer and our analytics team to help support and look at, you know, kind of the city holistically. Um, as we kind of come out of this pandemic. Um, and, and that's really kind of where I see the vision of, of, of data in the city going. 
as opposed to kind of more of a decentralized model and everyone kind of has their own pocket of, of, of data and analysis that they're doing, um, that the real opportunity really comes from really centralizing a lot of those, those data opportunities to really kind of drive insights and get guidance, you know, as we move forward out of the pandemic as one city and not a culmination of departments. Great. Yeah. I mean, I, I think having a real strategy around that seems great. It's just, it's always this, this question between how you, you centralize it like that and then still have the insight about the operations on the ground to be able to have useful takeaways, right? Get to the right people. And that's, and that's the goal is to get really that real time useful Intel to the boots on the ground that are actually making the difference. And, you know, and it's, it's that old adage around data is using, you know, using yesterday's data to drive tomorrow's insights uh, and really making sure that you are turning that around quickly so that the thing about data is it's, it's an ever changing thing. So, um, you know, so you need to be moving and that's why your focus is either real time or near real time, getting those insights to immediately react to something. As we were seeing um, when we, you know, you know, back when, when the pandemic started and we stood up our coordinated leadership form in the city where we were collaborating in real time, you know, sharing data as kind of a city, working across city departments. And I would like to see and where I'm focused on, and this kind of touched on a bunch of questions that we, that came up today is that is one of the goals of, of, coming out of this pandemic, some of the good stuff that we we were dealing with through the last 15 months that really will will pay dividends kind of coming out of COVID-19, that as we look at, at, at data as a city uh, and, and share information and data in real time to help support the decisions and help be a data-driven city. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this is, you know, now we're past Councillor Campbell's question and my comment. Um, but like, you know, the uh, it's like I think that real time data is really important, but also also the more of a longitudinal sense we can get of what's going on. Because I mean, one of the things I'll just say, like, I'm frustrated by in our city budget book is like we've sort of gotten religion on the idea of we should have metrics and goals or whatever, but that they're totally divorced from context. And what I mean by that is like, they tell me like, oh, we had this many interactions this year with teenagers, you know, of these ages, and then this many the year before and this many the year before. But they don't tell me how many teenagers that age are in the city of Boston and whether we threw more money or less money at that, at achieving a static state, right? Like, I think we, we have to get beyond the sort of like, lip service numbers like oh look it's it's data right <laughs> to, to kind of the like how we how we paint those pictures that are really like um that really give policymakers like at, both at our level and in the departments right kind of actionable intelligence um absolutely madam chair i mean i, I couldn't agree more and, and when you look at that you know that's just really kind of on the performance management side as we are looking to continually approve uh, improve as as government operations that, you know, to your point, you know, I've, you know, I've spoken to a thousand youth, you know, kind of in this space, but what is the context? Is that out of 3000? Well, that's great. That's one third. Is it out of 50,000? Well, that's not so good, you know? So really kind of understanding and really kind of, you know, wrapping around and getting a full complete picture of how we're actually doing to really focus on the performance management of that area or that initiative. So is it is it something that we need to double down on? Is it something that we should scrap? Is it something that we should, you know, kind of, you know, tweak a little bit? Because obviously we're not touching as many people, you know, as we would like to get kind of that the insights that we're looking for. But yeah, I I I completely understand kind of, you know, totally makes sense and it's spot on to my thinking as well. Um, and then the, the third question that, that I uh, cut Councillor Braden off on was, and I think Mike Lynch, you were about to answer it, was sort of about what the plan is to expand internet access in our libraries, from our libraries. I think, you know, just in general, Councillor 
Braden thinking about just the, the way in which the libraries are this important location for digital access for, you know, for students, for seniors, for our unhoused population. I definitely see that all the time. I've got both the central library and the West End branch library in my district, which are used heavily by all those populations. So um, yeah, if you, could, if you could speak a bit to that, that'd be great. Sure, uh, Madam Chair. I don't presume to speak for the libraries, but as you know, David Leonard had run operations at the library before he was president, and IT was a big part of his life, so he's very much focused on it. I know that their uh, strategic plan that they put out in March or April included looking outward, looking outside of their building for opportunities. I know that the Emergency Connectivity Fund, which we touched on earlier, will allow for funding beyond their footprint for the first time. And again, that is actually reimbursable under the E-rate program. So these these are potentials. I, I can't I can't speak for them. I don't know what the plan is. We we are in touch with them. I think we're meeting next week actually. But um, I, I think the opportunity does exist for them to do more wireless outside the four walls of the library to reach. I think also, uh, you know, that during the pandemic they expanded their hotspot program. I think they can look to expand that vastly at very little cost to themselves. This is a new program. The rules aren't out yet on how the money can get spent by the FC, uh, sorry, by Treasury, I think. Uh, I forget who's who's driving which fund. Um, when those rules come out, we'll, we'll have a better answer. Uh, the concern, again, is that the industry somehow stop us from being involved. And that's from the connectivity fund? Yes. Okay, so the, connecti so the connectivity is FCC and NTIA, yes. Yeah, and so just so I'm clear, there's the emergency broadband benefit, and that's something that's for specific individuals in the city of Boston, right, Correct. to access. And if they got it, that would relieve us as a city from providing this support, that this the financial support we've been providing. Is that's that correct? correct, yes. Got it. But that people need to apply for individually. We can't apply on their behalf, but are we doing anything in terms of clinics or anything? And I don't know if this is also a tech goes home question, but like how much are we... Yeah, I think it may also be, I mean, Dan knows this as well as I do. I think we're realizing we communicated with all of the agencies, but it literally, I think in some cases, it is such a complicated pathway. I think there has to be an awful lot of hand-holding on this, literally one-to-one -one attention. Right. Uh, I think Dan agrees with me on that. That's the problem with the program. It's the problem with all the programs, not just EPV. <laughs> so if no, I'm being blunt about it. We, our success rate to get people to sign up for Internet Essentials, which is Comcast's plan, is horrid. It's about 20%, and we pay for it. But even there, it, with all the handholding goes on, there's lots of factors. There's people who are afraid of the ISP. There's people who are afraid of the government. There are people who don't understand it. Councillor Mejia brought up the, the point of language and culturally appropriate uh, materials. It's just the ISPs, they're not looking to add necessarily a whole lot of new people at low-income plans. And one of the big issues with the EVB right now is it's temporary. So if you ask anyone, oh, how long is it going to pay for my internet? No one knows. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about you, but would I sign up for that? And last thing I'll mention, to, not to berate Verizon, but I'm going to do it, they're, they're upselling. Like there was New York Times and Washington Post stories about if you want to sign up for the emergency broadband benefit to get a Verizon plan, you have to switch to a different plan that when EBB money runs out, it's going to cost you more money. So there's just a lot of stuff that, to Mike's point, it's everything about it is complicated and you're working with uh, communities that are new to this. So it's, it's just bound to fail. And that, I don't mean to sound like such a downer, but it's just, it's such an opportunity that I feel like was wasted by the SEC, but. Well, so, I but I guess the relevant question for us, and obviously that's enormously frustrating. The relevant question for us is, is it, is there enough of a benefit to the program for us to throw, like, you know, if we were to throw like a bunch of people at like, you know, sitting in the libraries and working with folks one-on-one -on, -one on getting them signed up. Like the question is, is like, is the cost benefit there worth it? How much, like, how much would it be per month for folks? Like what's the if value? $50 a month plus a hundred dollars for whatever device you're going to use to get on a Chromebook or whatever. And counselor, to answer your question, yes. Uh, this funding, which we are discussing here today, Dan is going to spend some of this money figuring out videos to convey to people how to walk through this or remote trainings to do the same. He's already working on that. 
Glenn over at BNN is going to do the same thing to train up people in different social service agencies if they need a video clip to communicate with people. We're not fully out of COVID yet, so nobody's doing like come to our workshop and I'll sit next to me and walk us through the application process. I think some of it has to be a little bit still remote. And it's hard for an agency if, if, if uh, you know from years in government, uh, Madam Chair, that it, it's hard for an agency whose job is one thing, uh, addressing issues of seniors to all of a sudden change and become an expert in filling out a federal form that's 14 pages long. That's And that's kind of, so it's literally, it, it's going to be a little bit of like training the trainer to make it happen. It, there is money, actually the feds made some money available for it, but nobody knows how to do it yet. We're only about a week or two into the program. I would say, Councillor Bach, it's not about getting people to sign up for the EDB. It's about getting them to sign up for the low-income plans that the, the carriers provide. So it's getting people to sign up for Internet Essentials with Comcast, and then they can have the benefit of the EBB because Comcast will help them take care of that. Or Verizon has a $35 a month plan if you if you live in the city where Verizon or they call it a twenty dollars a month plan. It's not. It's thirty five, but it's two hundred megabytes down. It's it's a really good speed. But again, you you want to go to Verizon first or Comcast first, and then do the EBB. The problem is there's a large chunk of the population in, in our city that they don't want to go to a carrier for lots of different reasons, and that is a hurdle that we're working on especially with immigrant populations and, and populations that don't speak English. And it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah, it just, yeah. I mean, it just, uh, anything we could, I, I do feel, I take your point, Mike, about how it's hard for people to sort of learn another thing. I think the reality in the pandemic is that we have frequently asked our city departments, our social service agencies, our nonprofit partners to become expert at various ridiculous things, right? I mean, like we, you know, obviously we, I mean, we literally sent a bunch of city of Boston employees to help the state clear their unemployment backlog at one point. Um, but we also, you know, age strong has been signing people up for vaccines. They've, you know, been, been helping people fill out paper. Like there's just been a, there has been a bit of that in the pandemic, right? More than a bit. Um, and I think at this point, yeah, practically everybody, everybody who works for the city knows how to sign up for a vaccine on like three different websites. But um, but I guess, uh, yeah, it just, it feels to me, or like I think about our libraries and how much our, like, you know, the fact that at Copley we added, you know, a whole capacity to help people with housing search and such because of the fact that that was part of what the librarians were doing. It's just, yeah, it feels like, it's very frustrating the way it's been set up. It feels like if there's this one-time incentive though, that helps us get over what's already a very hard hurdle. Uh, like we've got to figure out how to, how to do it. But it also brings me back to my question and I promise we're nearing the end of this hearing, but my question that got punted, um, which, which is, I mean, it's just like, it just, it's not a very compelling patchwork. I just feel like our, um, our, you know, private broadband providers like to the point that Dan has about how much, like how much internet people will use when you actually give them the speeds and capacity that they need. I just feel like we're in this weird lull where it's like, yeah, we've got some competition, but not so much that they're really competing dramatically on price. And then, and then it's like, they're giving people kind of like terrible download speeds, but it's not, they're not, they're not financially incentivized enough to, get, to level us up to the next level of service. And so we're just like sitting in this doldrums yep. where, and and meanwhile, I mean, like, you know, South Korea's got everybody with real internet. Um, and I just, I guess I, I don't see, I'm actually, I'm not allergic to places where a private profit motive is actually going to drive the provision of like, you know, a stellar and expensive infrastructure. It just seems like we're trapped in this space where they're not adequately incentivized to provide the stellar infrastructure. And there's no way they will be because in order to do it on a purely private basis, they would have to charge everybody an arm and a leg, which is in the opposite direction of us saying that we want this to be a utility that everyone has access to, like water. So 
I just, it's, it's very hard for me to see how we're going to get where we need to get for the 21st century Bostonian on the path that we're on. I feel like Mike Lynch has lots to say. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, um, I, I'm as frustrated as you. Look, the simple way is the, the 1996 Act, this is 25 years of fade, failed federal policy. The concept was, let's make these guys, there's so much energy, let's make them compete with each other. Competing, well, they'll fight to reach every corner of every community and they'll provide an affordable pricing for initially it was cable TV, but later it's broadband. We kind of know that didn't really work, but we don't know how to turn the clock back on 25 years of federal policy. It's impossible. Right now, the city has engaged with other cities in lawsuits to fight for these fees, which we're protecting, to fight for our public assets in the right of way, which wireless companies want to use unfettered. It's a crazy world. I'm not really sure what the future is. I do know that in Boston, if we talked about uh, municipal broadband, if if somebody had $2 billion and said, go for it, it'd be fabulous. We could really build something sweet. It would take a long time. It would take years, five to 10 years. But I'm not sure that we have $2 billion or can figure out how to capitalize the $2 billion. On the other hand, the pandemic has taken the city of Boston and other cities and counties and forced them to take care of their citizens by by literally paying for their connectivity, something we had never done in the past. I mean, a year and a half ago when it started, we were sitting there saying, who'd have thunk that the city would be paying for people to have internet access at home? But that is exactly where we are a year and a half later. It has become our problem. And the solutions offered under these funding streams, I'm just saying they're a little questionable for us. So. Yeah, and counselor, yeah. counselor, you said earlier you used the, the railroads as I thought a really good analogy. Right. If we thought of uh, uh, internet as water or electricity, yeah. and if we said that you know uh, people who have household incomes of under thirty thousand, about forty percent of them don't have internet at home. That's right. So if you said for a moment that forty percent of the low income households in our city didn't have electricity or didn't have running water, it would be a national catastrophe. But up until the pandemic, people really weren't paying a lot of attention to the digital divide issues. And I hope, and this, I was really happy yep. that Councilman yeah, asked the question, I hope that we start moving towards this idea of the internet is as important as water and electricity. But, That's right. I mean, we're just not there yet. Because yeah. we can state that it is a utility, but it is not. It was not structured as a utility. And right now, it is actually void of any oversight. Nobody is pushing the industry in a particular direction. We in Boston are a little bit lucky. Comcast and Verizon, you can hate them, but they have contributed to the city of Boston. And during the pandemic, they were very, very responsive in the city of Boston. We work well with them. But you have to ask yourself a question. What is the crazy world we are in where we are trying to get an industry, a, a for-profit industry, to solve our problems of digital equity? It's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Um I'm going to stop talking. I think I'm going to get in trouble at some point. <laughs> no, I mean, so, and how much have we spent on paying for Bostonians connectivity over the pandemic? I'd say we've spent, Eddie will probably wince when I say this. I think it's somewhere around three to $4 million, depending on what you throw in. That doesn't include the Chromebooks that went to students. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I just think, I guess, Dan, to, I mean, like, I sort of think we're maybe at that moment where we have to be like, the internet is a utility and how are we going to change our practice? And like, you know, that was, people thought there was a time in American cities a hundred years ago where like access to a sewer or septic system was a nice thing that rich people had. Like, you know, and everybody else like threw the their food in the street, like literally, right? So I just think we have, we have moved our goalposts before on what counts as like a thing that everyone's got to have. And it just feels like that's what the pandemic, because that's what we've seen, right? I mean, these, like everything that we have done civically in the last year has been reliant on, on the internet. Counselor, we have a wait list of over a hundred organizations that want to work with us. 
that has developed during the pandemic because homeless shelters and senior housing and employment organizations and and we have partnerships now with MGH and with um, uh, Brigham and Women's like for telehealth. The, the issue we have, and, that, and I'm going to have David and Mike cover their ears, is it's funding. It's just that we don't have, even though our budget has grown so much, the demand has grown. So I, I think what I totally agree with you. I think now is the time. If it's not now, then when? Well, exactly. Do? If it's not now, uh, when do we I, do this? But I think Mike, and this is, I want to really give uh, a high five to Mike and David and the team. I think Boston is very lucky. Uh, relative to other cities, also so much more proactive. I mean, they give Tech Goes Home a million dollars a year via the peg. I, I mean, I tell other city partners that, and they like their jaws drop. Uh, maybe that's not the best way to ask for more money, as I shouldn't be saying that. But it's, uh, I think Boston should be really, really proud. That said, we have a, a lot more work to do. Yeah. Um. What and so you've got a wait list of 100 organizations. How many are you working with? About 200. Our biggest issue is that all of our existing partners wanted to scale. So we, for a period of time, took on zero new partners. So we've got like, you know, 40 Boston public schools that we work with. Uh, I'm, I'm rounding here. But, you know, there might be 10 new ones that now said they want to work with us. But we're like, we can't because... I'm not going to take away from an existing partner. It just doesn't make sense for us in terms of capacity. Um, and that's, it's a hard thing. And we're doing a lot. We're, we're having to tackle issues of equity where like the Quincy elementary school is a massive partner of ours. They're one of our biggest. Well, is it fair that the Quincy elementary runs more tech goes home for their families than say, you know, family high school. Like, so how do we, it's just the decisions my program team are having to make right now. It, it's tragic because they're having to say no to people who are so worthy of these resources. Um, but we're, I mean, we're doing everything we can to, to figure it out. Councilor, I don't, I don't want to appear negative. I mean, I, I don't think there is a magic answer to anything here. Boston is doing a bunch of smaller things targeted at distinct populations and constituencies. Uh, we found that through the Digital Equity Fund application. We got 100 good applications. These people were being creative about how to address the problem for their clients, our residents. Uh, we had programs like, I want to get their name right, I think it's Little Brothers, they're an elderly service program. Uh, we were buying hotspots for them, and it, you know this started 14 months ago, right? So every week I've been saying, to them, guys, this is going to end at some point. You've got to figure out what you're going to do here, you know, have people figure out how to buy their own, buy yours. And they're picking up the expense of that now. They've come around to it because those agencies realize they can't deliver their services without this connectivity. So they recognize and accept some of the responsibility that connectivity might be a burden on them, a cost of doing business. So things are still sort of shifting. I don't know that we have great answers. You worked at the BHA. The BHA put out an RFP for rooftop access. I think Starry responded to it. I think they're working with Starry. The idea is Starry beams the signal, hits the building, inside wiring gets it into the communities. Or maybe they do wireless outside. I, they're not really sure. They're working on final aspects of that. But it's, it's. I think going forward, it's gonna be 20 different solutions. Not a magic bullet if we still use that phrase. Got it. But you think that municipal broadband for the city of Boston would cost $2 billion and take five to 10 years? And I think that because San Francisco just executed a study, I guess it was a, just before the pandemic, and the price tag, they, you know, San Francisco is similar to us, at least in terms of population and size and its approach to solutions. And in somewhat, you know, it, it, it's, it's residency, if you will. Yeah, they pegged it at $2 billion. And um, yeah, and then I guess it's just a question of as Treasury comes down with these regulate, well, is it is it Treasury? You said you weren't sure, or did you confirm so the, it was? So the big money, the ARPA money, there's the, money in there. The American Rescue Act money is being funneled through, treasure, uh, through Treasury. Oh, as no, that? Funds. Yeah, that's, that's the big bucket. We're right. exempted from spending that to build out broadband because we already have decent coverage in every census block of the city. 
Got it. So we're not, so even though broadband's listed as one of the uses on that, it's- That's really targeted at rural communities. There was a great article in the New York, I'll send it. There was a great article in the New York Times on Monday that said, has anybody noticed that all this federal funding is targeted towards rural communities? I'm not begrudging small towns and rural communities, but I'm just looking through there saying, what can somebody like Boston do and not seeing a lot of opportunity? 93% of people who are not connected in the, in the state of Massachusetts, 93% live in urban areas. 93%. And yet the money is flowing in a lot of ways. So, like Mike said, don't want to begrudge rural communities, but... Yeah, we can't get into an urban versus rural. Yeah, it's, you know, it's hard to get it in people's yeah, heads yeah, that land yeah. doesn't vote, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> something about the visual appeal of that to people. Um, it's very frustrating uh, sometimes. But, um, okay, but I guess, for, and then, but separately, the connectivity grant, sorry, emergency connect, what's the, what's the yes, title? Yes, the of? emergency connectivity fund. It was that second, what do they call right. it, tra tranche of money, right? And is that the seven billion? That's that's about seven billion dollars. So, but nationally, that, right? And that's national, right? And um, and and we think the regulations on that are being promulgated by whom? We think that we know that they're being promulgated by the FCC. By the FCC. Yeah. And do you guys know if anybody? I realize this isn't really a do it question. It might be an IGR question, but do you guys know if anybody? Um, on the sort of like representing municipality oh, yeah. side is lobbying. So, yeah. so uh, I, I belong, we belong to a group called the National Association of Telecommunications Offices and Advisors. So our group kind of specializes in this stuff. We worked with the U.S. Conference of Mayors, National League of Cities, the National Association of Counties. We lobbied, met with, and wrote comments and letters advocating for some loosening up of funding to local government. The I, I could send you the, the reply draft order, if you will. Um, but the gist of it is that the law, meaning Congress, wrote the bill in such a way that we cannot lo loosen up these rules. What we wanted to do was say, let us be the providers. Let us act as the broker between the providers and the need. And, and they took us out of the mix. Now, I, I don't know, you know, nobody's gone to court over it yet, but... It, the law was kind of written that way, so they weren't completely wrong. But the, the FCC is, is currently with a Democratic vacancy, so it is a 2-2 tie agency. So Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel just didn't have the heft, I think. I, I can't believe I'm saying all this stuff, but I don't think she was able to carry that, carry that in, in a different direction, you know? So. Don't worry, Mike. Yeah. No one knows what YouTube is. Don't nobody, worry knows, nobody knows where to find this, right? <laughs> I, so I guess, okay, but that makes me think that we're not, because what you had said earlier suggested that there might be some hope for us, depending on how those regs come so, out. So within that big bucket of $7 billion, you, we people who have E-rate communities, they, these, are, these are dollars that are going into E-rate. E-rate is usually just like peg fees. Peg fees are a cable fee. E-rate is actually a telephone fee. The old telephone fee access charge funds E-rate. The seven billion is new federal dollars being dumped into a good portion of it being dumped into E-rate. We are the city of Boston. We are an E-rate provider to our schools and to our libraries. If we can figure out a way to apply, and they'll be doing it within the next two weeks, we're just going to carve out and say we might do this, we might do this, we might do, I don't know, learning centers and BHA family developments or something, you know, something like that, and that might get covered by BPS. This is I don't. This is guesswork yeah. at this point, well, but that's, yes, we are at that point of saying these are things we we speculate on, and it, it is, I, I'm trying to be very, I'm managing expectations, I don't, so. Yeah, I mean, I would just say I would be all for anything we yeah. can do to expansively interpret library users, yeah. you know, school families, and, and just think about, you know, if, it, if the city of Boston can be on the cutting edge of kind of yeah. using that authority. So much the better, in my opinion. So, well, we're in close touch with both schools and libraries. I'll leave you alone after this and say, hey, do me a favor, watch the last 10 minutes of this hearing. <laughs> Sounds good. It might be a little more than 10 minutes. I apologize for that. Um, but I, I think with that, I'm done with my questions. Um, and uh, and I think counselors have all had a chance to say, ask theirs. Um, so, I'll, I'll just give you, Chief, if you have any last words before I uh, adjourn our session. 
Now, thank you very much. I really appreciate the the opportunity to not only you know highlight the the work that we've done in a in a very you know difficult time for the city and and for Bostonians and you know the work that we have done kind of really reaching and, and communicating uh, you know the situation uh, you know whether it's you know. Uh, you know, turning back the clock a little bit, you know, you know how how hot spots were cropping up in the city of Boston. Now coming to the point where we're trying to get people vaccinated, so it's been a uh, it's been a very challenging uh, 15 months. But you know, and I, I think we had kind of touched on this as well, is that there's you know there's always opportunity in a crisis, you know, and the goal is now how do we capitalize on this? And Madam Chair, you had kind of kind of coined it out very very succinctly if not now when you know that this is our opportunity to have a bite at that apple even though it may be a bit elusive but if it's if it's not now when is it going to happen this is this is the conversation that i'm having with cios across the country uh, that you know and, and i think dan noy said it as well i mean is it going to take another pandemic i mean what did we learn by this one you know so you know the the goal would be you know coming out of this uh, really kind of identifying our populations and, and what is needed, um, you know, and, and this is an opportunity for us to kind of step up. And, and I agree that, you know, whether we categorize this as a utility or not, this is, uh, you know, undoubtedly what the city of Boston and, you know, cities around the country need. Uh, we just need to kind of figure out how we're going to get there. Um, you know, and it, it always takes, you know, and it kind of takes one to kind of start forging the path and then the other cities follow. And a lot of cities do look to the city of Boston. So, you know, if I would, I would love to, you know, kind of work together collaboratively and myself and, and Mike and, and Dan and the rest of the gang uh, and figure out how we can do this. Because like you said, if not now, when? Absolutely. All right, well, thank you. And thank you again to Glenn and to Dan and Marvin um, for joining us um, and, and all the work that you do as our partners with the, through the PEG Access Fund. Um, and uh, with that, this hearing of the Boston City Council's Ways and Means Committee is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, everybody.